Good morning, everybody, and um, can I welcome you all to the 22nd meeting of the Education and Culture Committee in 2014. Uh, we've received apologies from Liam MacArthur, um, and Tavish Scott will be attending as a substitute. I believe he's been slightly delayed, but he should be here shortly. Can I remind everybody, though, to make sure that they have all electronic devices switched off because they do interfere with the sound system. Uh, our first item today is to decide whether to take item three in private, which is to consider our approach to scrutinising the Scottish Government draft budget for 2015-2016. Uh, do members agree? Agreed, thank you. Uh, our next item is to hear evidence on the new national qualifications. Our aim is to assess the implementation of the new qualifications and look forward as the rollout continues. We will be putting key issues to the Cabinet Secretary uh, for Education and Lifelong Learning when we hear from him next week. But today, can I welcome, um, and it's a rather large panel today, but uh, we hope to get you all in the one room at the one time, and hopefully we'll get some uh, decent uh, discussion uh, ongoing this morning. But can I welcome Terry Lanigan, who represents the Association of Directors of Education in Scotland, Graham Logan from Education Scotland, Larry Flanagan from the Educational Institute of Scotland, Ken Muir from the General Teaching Council for Scotland, Jane Peckin from the National Association of Schoolmasters and Union, Union of Women Teachers, uh, Dr Janet Brown from the Scottish Qualifications Authority and Richard Goring from the Scottish Secondary Teachers Association. Uh, welcome to you all. Um, I'm going to move straight to questions, but can I just do the usual thing, which is, particularly given it's a large panel, not everybody has to answer every question, otherwise we'll only get about two questions in this morning. So um, obviously some questions will be directed at particular individuals or groups, um, and others, uh, if you don't have anything particular to add, then I would prefer you didn't add it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we are going to move... Uh, straight to questions. Can I start the questioning this morning um, with a general question, which is to all of you. Um, obviously, there were a lot of issues and stresses over the last year or two in the implementation of the Curriculum for Excellence and the New Qualifications in secondary schools. But despite all of that, what is your um, assessment of where we are now? What is your assessment of the outcome of that uh, difficult process and the fact that the qualifications, um, sorry, the examinations have now been, the first round have been completed, and obviously pupils have done uh, tremendously well in those examinations. But I would just like to hear what your assessment of is of the position we're in now. If I start with Terry. Thank you. Um, I think it would be uh, very surprising, Chair, if, the, uh, if there hadn't been a number of issues with a, a, an initiative as large and ambitious as Curriculum for Excellence. Um, and uh, obviously, uh, a key pressure point was going to be the first set of national qualifications. And I've, as I've said in my written submission, I think it's to everybody's credit within the system that the, the first set of, of uh, national qualifications and the first set of, of the exams went so smoothly and the issuing of the certificates and the post results service, etc. Also, as I've said in my submission, I believe that Scottish education is in a very strong position at the moment. I think that we are well placed to move forward, but that's not to ignore that there are a number of major challenges ahead. Um, I'm sure we'll get on to issues such as assessment, which is a, a, a genuine uh, issue at the moment. Um, and I do think that we have the challenge of developing a true progressive coherent 3 to 18 curriculum. I do believe that we are some distance away from that yet, but I think that everybody within the system is well placed to take forward that next challenge. Graham. Thanks very much. Uh, morning, everyone. I think, you know, at this point, we've been developing curriculum for excellence for 10 years and international experts like Alma Harris who we saw at the learning festival last week commented on just how admirable it is that we've been steadily working towards um, transforming learning and teaching um, in Scotland and that we do have a consensus although there have been some challenges. I think looking at the inspection evidence we've seen a transformation in, in learning and teaching in Scottish schools. 90% for example of secondary schools inspected have had a key strength in young people's motivation and engagement in learning. So all the effort that teachers have been putting into transforming learning and teaching is impacting very positively, um, and we can see that. Uh, the, the new national qualifications are one part of that story, but we, we've got to commend teachers in primary, secondary, early years and so on for that collective effort. I think, um, as Terry says, there are an, a number of challenges moving forward. 
and that is learning the lessons as, as we go, adapting the support that we provide um, as national agents to, to schools and, and local authorities. And that's something that we're, we're keen to continue to do, to do as well as look at um, reports such as the Commission on Developing Scotland's Young Workforce, which sets out some next steps for us as well. So it, it, it's a point in time where a huge amount of, of uh, change has been implemented um, the successful impact on, on children and young people's learning experiences in schools um, is, is, is clear to us through our independent evaluation. And we look forward, I think, to continuing to work together and holding that consensus that we are going in the right direction. Thank you. Larry. No, sorry, Larry. Just leave it. Just leave it. Don't, don't don't somebody else will deal with it. Thank you. <laughs> we, we have to operate it manually at EIS headquarters, so you, know, you, you have staff to do that. Um, uh, thanks very much, Chair. I, I'd just like to make three points uh, as briefly as I can. The first is, and I think this will be echoed by uh, colleagues from the other teacher unions, is that an assessment of last year um, has to acknowledge that the workload burden that was faced by teachers and schools last year is simply unsustainable. I, mean, I think it is to the credit of the profession that the qualifications were delivered and the diet was successful in terms of the uh, the young people's uh, outcomes. But in the health and wellbeing survey, which we carried out before the summer with over 7,000 respondents, uh, workload was an issue across all sectors, but in particular in the secondary sector, over 80% of teachers said workload um, was a severe cause of uh, stress, um, with again over 80% saying that they were extremely stressed. Uh, and we think in terms of moving forward, that we have to recognise that that was an exceptional effort to deliver the qualifications, but it does need to be addressed. Um, and we have carried out a, a recent survey, which um, I'll, I'll share with the committee. We only just closed it uh, yesterday. But one of the concerns in that is that we asked, has action been taken in your uh, workplace to address the issues of workload around the qualifications? And 80% of respondents said no action had been taken in the workplace. Now, I know that some action has been taken nationally around uh, verification and so forth, but in terms of workplace, we, we seem to be getting a repeat of last year when we said this was uh, unsustainable. So that is a, a, an absolutely key concern, I think, for the profession. The other issue which uh, I think is important to highlight is that what was delivered last year was the first set of National 4, National 5 qualifications. What wasn't delivered last year is a vision of curriculum for excellence senior phase and we are still quite a way removed from that bigger picture and I would agree with Terry that potentially around the CFE framework we have, a, we have an education system which will be unbeatable but what we got last year is a good bit removed from that bigger vision so a lot of work is required I think uh, in terms of moving forward to make sure that we achieve some of those aims simple ones like reducing the burden of assessment for pupils and for staff that clearly wasn't achieved last year because everyone's agreed that in actual fact the burden of assessment increased uh, for all concerned. Ensuring that we have breadth across the curriculum in terms of the senior phase. And most importantly, ensuring that there is time for deeper learning because that is the key objective of the changes, to move away from the idea that you simply pass exams to the idea that you have a, a process that engages you in, in a deeper learning experience which better prepares you for uh, the world in which young people are going to move into. So, you know, I, I think there are uh, there has been a success in terms of the delivery of the qualifications, but there are certainly issues to be addressed moving forward this year uh, around workloads, and there, and there are bigger issues to be addressed in terms of making sure we achieve the ambition of the the, the, the curriculum for excellence senior phase. Thank you, um, Ken. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I mean, I'm heartened to hear from my colleagues the, the degree of consensus that there is around where we are because I think that's reflected in the report that I produced on the experiences of the first years of the Nationals uh, 4 and 5. I, mean, I think in terms of where we are, uh, the point's been made. I mean, we're, we're trying to deliver for the first time ever uh, an ambitious curriculum programme from 3 to 18. That's never been done before in the history of Scottish education. So, as Terry suggested, it's, it's, it's no surprise that there were some uh, difficulties in implementing the first year of the new national qualifications. So, 
I would suggest that that probably has been no different to the major curriculum changes that we've been introducing over the last generation in Scottish education. If you go back to standard grade, for example, we had a major review of the assessment arrangements at the end of the first year of introducing standard grade, and we learnt lessons from that and made changes. It was the same when we introduced higher still with intermediates and revised higher. We uh, adjusted the assessment arrangements uh, after that. We looked again at some of the courses as well to see that they were entirely deliverable. So I think we are very much over the, over the hump, if you like, in terms of uh, getting uh, <laughs> curriculum for excellence into place but that's not to say that we have uh, resolved all of the issues and all of the problems and I think the, the, the reflections report uh, makes that point very clear there is still work that has to be done in order to achieve what I think are genuinely consensual aspirations for curriculum for excellence and as, as Larry himself suggested you know, internationally recognised as being a way forward to provide the best for, for youngsters now and in the future in Scottish education Thank you very much. Uh, Ken, uh, Jean. Um, it will come as no surprise that obviously I'll echo quite a bit of what my colleague from EIS said, but I would like to say that um, Curriculum for Excellence is a process that's ongoing. I wouldn't agree with Ken that we're as far up and over the hump as, as potentially we could be, but I think if we continue to work in partnership successfully, that's the best way to deal with it. Um, the issue of workload is something that is increasingly concerning to members across the profession. Um, and I think that um, the messages of change that are happening nationally aren't necessarily feeding down to school level. I think teachers still feel extremely anxious about the next phase. That's not to say that it shouldn't be happening and we shouldn't be learning from our experiences, but I think it would be foolish to think that we're over the worst uh, at this point. Um, I just think that uh, we need to be continuing to listen to the profession as well as uh, to each other and uh, continue to work together to take this forward successfully. Yeah, thank you very much, Jean. Janet. Well, I, I, again, um, I would echo everything everyone said in, in the context of we are developing a new approach to 3 to 18 learning. And the approach is completely different. It's, it's new learning, it's new teaching. It also requires a change in approach to assessment, and that was one of the fundamental principles of Curriculum for Excellence. And that included um, allowing teachers to, to take back the ownership to, to be able to use their professional judgment in terms of their ability to create a culture, create a, a curriculum that was interesting and tailored to individuals. And I think that flexibility in itself has been a real challenge for, for, for the entire system. And one of the things that we need to do, for, I think, from this year is understand how we can support that flexibility continuing, but also to provide the, the, the infrastructure to be able to allow teachers to be able to continue down that path. Um, the critical achievement, I think, of, of this year is not only the qualifications, because Curriculum for Excellence is not only about qualifications. We talk a lot about National 1 through National 5, and hires and advanced hires, but there are a variety of other awards and, and, and um, qualifications that children in school should be thinking about, should be getting. That's the fundamental breadth of Curriculum for Excellence. And I think a measure of the success is the ability for people within the school sector to provide that breadth of opportunity for different students, dependent on the needs of those students. And Ultimately, the measure is, are we giving every single student in Scotland a better life chance? And I think we've made a really important step along the journey here. But as a system, we all have to learn from what's happened this year. Each part, every single member around the table have things that we need to reflect on, to look at, and that's part of what Ken's re report has done, and do things differently this year to be able to make sure that we can continue to fulfil the, the, the passion and the, and the ideals of what Curriculum for Excellence is all about. Thank you. And Richard? Uh, I think we're at a very exciting time in Scottish education because I think we have a, a, a very exciting future ahead of us. Um, but there are many, many issues, as have been echoed um, by <laughs> various people here. One of the issues, I think, is there's still not a full understanding in secondary schools of how broad general education matches in with the senior phase, and I think that needs to be addressed. Um, 
senior phase, there's obviously much more accountability on teachers in terms of results and so on. And I think the mindset that that is the most important factor for teachers has to be addressed and realise we are talking about other issues as well. It's not just about results, but that's, that's the mindset that teachers have and have had for many years and have been forced to acknowledge for many years. So exams, exams, exams. This year, we're obviously in a transition between National 4-5s and the new hire. I think roughly two-thirds of subjects are presenting at the new hire, uh, according to our surveys that we've done. And I think there's a fear of what the new hires are going to be about in terms of support and uh, what can come from Education Scotland and the SQA to support that. Our surveys showed very little change in um, being confident with both Education Scotland and SQA in terms of the support that's available this year compared to last year, and I'm sure we'll come back to that later. There's an element, of, there's so much changing happening in schools at the moment, and of course the whole senior phase particularly, as I'm talking about just now, is on top of all of that, and many, many teachers feel totally submerged by the whole thing. Uh, workload issues are huge, working time agreements in schools are not being um, built up to accommodate that amount of work. And we have many, many teachers talking about 50, 60 hours a week in terms of keeping up with what's been expected of them. So it's not all positive by any means. We were absolutely delighted that the results for National 4 and 5 were as positive as they were. This year we're talking higher, we're talking about the gold standard, and I think there's a lot of apprehension and anxiety about that uh, and the fear that if things don't work out, what's going to happen? And many teachers who in secondary schools tend to be subject-oriented are thinking in the wider sense as well and looking at, you know, are we going to let down these pupils across the whole education system? The hope is we won't. There's a bit more confidence about the hires than there maybe was last year about national fours and fives, probably partly because they've gone through the process to have a better understanding of what's demanded of them. But there are still major problems about um, materials, resources, budgets, and obviously time. Thank you all very much for those um, opening remarks. Um, I should have said at the beginning that uh, I think on behalf of the committee I can, can congratulate, it's the first opportunity we've had to congratulate all of the, uh, the teachers, uh, the parents, the local authorities um, and of course the pupils in achieving their extend, outstanding results that they did uh, this year. It has been, I think, um, a, a great, a remarkable uh, effort on everybody's behalf to get us where we are today, despite all the issues that we're about to get into. So uh, can I just uh, make those remarks on behalf of the committee that... Uh, we certainly um, are very proud of our pupils, uh, our teachers and everybody else involved in the system for getting us to this point. Um, we've got a number of members who want to come in, so can I begin by asking George Adam to start us off. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, everyone. Uh, one of the big issues that was discussed throughout the process was the, the communication or perceived lack of it or, uh, the, with teachers with regards to the whole process. Now, there's a number of... Uh, submissions that have been made. The SQA actually said there was a comprehensive communication of existing key documents and resources. But then again, the EIS then said uh, there was a failure to communicate key messages. Now, there was also a quote from Ken Cunningham, the General Secretary of the School Leaders Scotland. The preparation consultation, there's been more than I can ever remember. The amount of effort that's gone into the, this knocks the others into the corner. Now, that's quite a lot of different opinions over the whole process, and it's one of the things that's been discussed at length uh, during the process as well. And I was just wondering, uh, for the future, as we look to uh, what we're going to do, uh, how could we actually communicate with teachers? How could we improve it further? Can I start off with Larry? Um, I think maybe you could break down communication into two areas, because one of the areas where we think there's been a failure around communication, this is partly to do with the, the timetable for implementation, uh, is in, in relation to the big picture of what the changes to the senior phase actually represented. Um, and I think the SSTA document, or it might be the NSS, uh, refers to, for example, the, some of the confusion that exists in schools around the use of unit assessments, where the unit assessments have been designed to, to deliver a different type of assessment from the unit assessments that were previously there for Intermediate 1 and Intermediate 2. But when they arrived in schools, a lot of teachers saw them as being quite similar uh, and approached them in a similar fashion. But in actual fact, the whole point of the unit assessments was to move to the kind of holistic uh, classroom evidence-based assessment 
that would underpin the assessment arrangements, but wouldn't duplicate anything that was going to be in an external exam. Now, that, that is absolutely one of the key changes to assessment under uh, Curriculum for Excellence. But that, that philosophy um, wasn't communicated effectively to schools, so that the, there was a, a lack of understanding around the changes that were desired in terms of, of CFE. Um, and I think that's, that's what created a number of the, a number of the issues uh, that then had to be, had to be dealt with. Um, on, a, on a more direct communication issue, um, in the reflections group, one of the issues that we looked at was the fact there's actually a, there's a great deal of information out there. One of the challenges is finding the bit of information you need. Um, so there is an issue about everything being available on the website, but nobody tuning into here are the key messages that teachers need to have in order to take forward implementation. And I think we kind of recognise that, and th th there were efforts over the course of the year to try and refine the message. Uh, we've constantly said putting something on a website is not the same as communicating to teachers. Um, so that you know that uh, you know if, if I was speaking to Jan about something, she would say to me, "Well, it's on the website." Uh, you know, and then you will like, "Well, right, how do I find it? Or how do I know it's on the website? Or how do I know that's the, the answer to the question I've got?" And I think that's one of the areas where uh, the lesson to be learned is that sometimes uh, less is more in terms of effective communication, focusing on the key issues. Uh, and, and I think we're probably in a stronger place now than we were a year ago. And of course, the final backdrop to all of that is if you're in a school situation uh, where you, you know, you're teaching the pupils and you are trying to implement the changes, uh, the time to then go and find all the information that's out there is difficult. So in that kind of compressed implementation period, you know, which is, again, one of our criticisms, it was too compressed, uh, it's really important that the focus is on what is absolutely key in terms of the, the, the delivering the, the, the new qualifications. So, so I think, um, I don't, Ken Cunning was my old head teacher, so far be it, and he appointed me, so far be it for me to disagree with Ken. There's been a lot of information out there but sometimes it's actually about how you access information and how you communicate more directly with teachers, I think. OK. I want, I want to bring in uh, Jane and Richard first, because I think you, you were nodding vigorously there, Jane. What's your, what's your view on this? Well, I, th I was nodding, because I think it was our uh, response that Larry was referring to with the confusion. I think, it, I think Larry's right. There is a huge amount of information out there, but it's how you find what you need. And the key issue is time. I think what's happened as well is that the the, the working time agreements have not been revisited to look at how they build in enough time for teachers to go and access what they need. Because there's a finite number of hours in a day. And I think in, unless things are really clearly set out, um, teachers are just not going to be able to access what they need. So I, th I think you're right, Larry. We do need some system of... of um, making that easier. It's not that the information's not there, it's just about how you find it and what suits your specific needs. Um, so, yeah. Um, an awful lot of what I would say has been said just now. What I think we do need to have is much clearer signposting for both the SQA and the Education of Scotland websites so it's easier to access the information in its final form. I mean, one of the problems is there can be conflicting information on the same websites. Uh, I think that has been improved and is, is improving. And a lot of the criticism that is coming from teachers in our association is based on last year's experience, and the hope is that that will be less of a problem this year. So I think that's probably the key message there. Thanks, Richard. Can I bring in Graham at this stage yeah. and, and then Janet? <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, I think, you know, over the course of the year, we were listening to the feedback from teachers and created a new key curriculum support website, which aimed to get you to what you need, you know, within sort of three clicks. So it sat above all the online content and it was the aim of it was to get teachers to the guidance and support they need. I think because of the model of curriculum for excellence, which, as you know, is based on broad national guidance with with a lot of development work at local level, a key thing was to get to, and support teachers to share their information and to share the resources. So again, over the course of the year, we published 
kind of 135 different packages of approaches from 22 authorities in terms of course materials and then through the key curriculum support website try to focus in and get teachers to, to what they need. Also what we've done is bring all secondary head teachers together um, as a group for the first time last year and at that, uh, th those opportunities meant that we could share key messages, we could showcase the senior phase models that Larry was referring to in different approaches at local level to meeting um, the needs. Because of the nature of Curriculum for Excellence, where it's not a one-size-fits-all, it's developed locally to meet local needs. There is a lot of variance, but that is uh, intended and that's part of the, the process. So we've really been focusing on sharpening up and sharing key messages through the Key Curriculum Support website, starting new electronic bulletins which give the information that people need, and improving signposting because we recognise that it's really important that when teachers do have time, um, they get to what they need and they get it very quickly. We've also been doing a lot of work with our partners on tackling unnecessary bureaucracy. So again, we've been producing case studies of how uh, schools have reduced um, planning and assessment burdens to create more time. There's still a lot of work to do on that, but we're really keen to push the examples where schools and local authorities have been successful at reducing unnecessary bureaucracy to to create more time um, for, for teaching and again we're commissioning independent research into that which we're expecting um, to, to share with the Tackling Bureaucracy Working Group in the next month or so. So there is still a lot of work to do on that but a real concerted effort when we put out a joint statement with ADES on progress made um, to reduce unnecessary bureaucracy. Inspectors have been challenging it uh, through the inspection process. And it's quite interesting through our own survey of teachers through our pre-inspection questionnaire. So from, from April 2012 to April 2014, um, we had um, 8,470 teach secondary uh, teachers um, surveyed uh, through the pre-inspection process with a 73% return rate. And, you know, about 87% 80, of them said that they you know, they were um, having time in school to discuss and shape the curriculum through the staff discussion and working groups. So in the best examples, as Jane was saying, the working time agreements have been amended um, to create that time, but that's not universally the case. And what we need to do is showcase the best practice where bureaucracy has been reduced and that has been um, matched by amending the collegiate hours working agreement so that there is as much time for professional dialogue and development um, as, pos as possible. Okay, thank you. Hey, Janet. Yes, I think it's, it, it's been said that um, the materials are out there, the challenges, how, how can people access them, how can people be signposted to them. And I think um, everybody has learnt lessons this year. We definitely learnt lessons and, we, uh, and as been said, we've made some changes to the way that we've um, signposted on our website. But the website is not the only mechanism that I think we need to use for, for communication. I think that, that very, very much it's about people-to-people -people discussions and it's, it's really, really important that we do get out there and we talk to people and we hear the questions that people are co coming back with so we can try and address those. So we, we do run a series of events and over the last year we've run over 390 events that are there to support teachers in terms of the implementation of the new qualifications and we'll continue to do that next year. And the lessons that we've learned from those events will implement into the new ones. An additional thing that happened during the course of this year was also the fact that there was a, a great demand from local authorities and from teachers themselves for continuous professional development in specific subject areas. And that was something else that we, we hadn't planned to do, but we did do. And we ran about 390 of those as well during the course of the year. And we'll be doing those again, learning lessons from last year for the new hires coming up in, in the future. So there, there is a face-to-face -face engagement, sort of one-to-many in, in, in terms of the events. But the other aspect that we believe is very, very helpful, and we've got very positive feedback from schools on it, is we have a dedicated Curriculum for Excellence Liaison team that um, is targeted to work with individual schools and individual teachers to come to parents' nights, to come to the schools themselves. And they undertake about 200 visits a month. And that, again, is about providing that signposting, providing that uh, ability to give us feedback to allow us to be able to modify how we communicate. 
And that then goes back to, OK, well, there's lots of documents out there. How do you make sure people have the appropriate access to them? And yes, that does end up being on the web. And I think that's, it's a very important tool because you can arguably keep the most current version up on the web and, and people are, are able to be able to see what's, um, what is the current version of anything. So what we've been doing is providing targeted updates to individual teachers, so specific changes for specific subjects. We send those out to, um, to that particular group. We also give special up updates on the changes to support materials um, that are there and, and that we, we know just sending out a blank, blanket update is not helpful, but targeting those individuals who would, who would find those updates important is something that we're increasing, increasingly doing. It's, we've used um, Ken Muir's um, uh, magazine from the GTCS to be able to, to highlight some of the changes. And I think the, the, the last point is to really make the web a lot clearer to, to um, give people one, one page to be able to go to that one page for one particular subject and then be able to go through that page to the appropriate uh, materials on the web. There is a significant amount of material. There needs to be a significant amount of material. The challenge is to make sure that it is easily um, tracked and easily uh, travelled through so people get the right information. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Kate. George. Not oh, George. Bro. Call. Thanks very much for con convening or getting there eventually. <laughs> <laughs> um, similar to communication, I'm, I'm keen to understand um, how well you feel that teachers were supported in this process. Um, reading through the evidence, there seems to be a, a range of views. Um, there's certainly indications that there was uh, professional focus papers, there was web-based support materials, there was uh, subject route maps, and, you know, Janet, you mentioned about the uh, subject implementation events where there was a substantial number of teachers attended it. Um, so was it a, was it a concern that um, across the piece there, there was a lack of support, or was that lack of support down to individual local authorities or down to individual schools? Or, I mean, what was the case? Where, where was the, the best practice in supporting teachers, and where was there areas that could have been better improved? Larry? Yeah, um, that, certainly from the feedback from our members, uh, that has been one of the issues, that, the issue of support, um, partly in relation to resources and materials, and that's linked into Education Scotland, and, and we mentioned in, the, uh, in our submission that there was an agreement previously with the Cabinet Secretary around fully fleshed courses being made available this was to allow people to focus in the previous year on, on S3. Um, and in fact, Ken was in charge of that when he was still with uh, Education Scotland. Um, and I know in the early stages, for example, all the local authorities were uh, on board for that. But in the end, uh, around a third of the local authorities didn't actually contribute to that kind of national bank. So there were some very good resources produced through that mechanism. And I know some work was commissioned. But there were also gaps, and there were some areas where the the core support materials were little more than uh, advice notes rather than the the units. So you know, I think that there was a, a significant question there around that. I think there was also, and I, mean, I do acknowledge that um, we have a, we have quite a good working relationship with SQA. So you know, we'll happily go to them with issues that members are raising, uh, and there is a resource issue for SQA in terms of how it can respond to the demands. But, but one of the ideas behind the, uh, the verifiers, for example, and I think, I think SQ actually touched, touch upon this, was that that was supposed to be a pool of experienced people who could go out and support schools in the different subject areas. Uh, and there was an issue there because some of the verifiers themselves uh, were still acquiring confidence around the, the changes. Uh, but also in some areas, because these are these are teachers who are you know uh, who do this additional role, um, local authorities couldn't release them uh, from their teaching duties to actually go and provide the support. So there was definitely a kind of a gap there, um, you know. And I, and I know the numbers look impressive when you say there were 390 meetings and so forth. But when you think about the number of secondary schools and the number of departments, uh, the question is how do these meetings impact? Uh, and I, one of the areas 
without developing it. One of the, the difficulties this time round in terms of the the qualifications is that we've seen over the last six, seven, eight years a move away from subject principal teachers to faculties in secondary schools, where the faculty head is in charge of maybe two or three different areas. Now, when Higher Still came in, I was a principal teacher of English, and I attended four or five meetings with the SQA as a principal teacher of English. If you've got a faculty which covers art, music and drama, and you've got a faculty head, with the best will in the world, it's extremely difficult for that faculty head to be on top of the, the detailed nuance of qualifications. Um, and in the past, the subject principal teachers were the key mechanism for getting messages from Education Scotland or LTS um, or HMI or SQA, taking that back into the departments. And I think that that's been one of the kind of gaps uh, that we've seen this time round. If I could just finish with just quoting you, one of the questions we asked uh, around the, the new CFE hire this year was, how would you rate the support on offer with regard to the introduction of the new CFE hire? 1% um, said excellent, 4% said good, 30% said adequate, and 65% are saying poor. So this is for the new hire coming in. So even although there might be a, a slightly stronger sense of confidence around the new hire based on some experience with National 5, people are still questioning the lack of uh, support that's there. So, you know, it's kind of echoing the point that's made earlier. We shouldn't rest on our laurels here. There are still big challenges in the year ahead, especially with uh, the higher qualification. Okay. Terry. Um, <clears throat> I think this is closely linked to the previous question, because um, I think support and communication go hand in hand. Um, as a member of the, the CFE management board, a huge, uh, there's been a huge emphasis over the last three or four years about communication. And uh, the problem with communication is that it relies on everybody in the system to uh, be effective. And I am quite clear, and I've been 37 years uh, working in education, that there has been no initiative in Scottish education during that time where there has been more communication and, or more support. There maybe have been issues at times in signposting people towards the appropriate support, but as has been said, the material is definitely there. And I do believe that it is the, it's the responsibility, obviously, of the national organisations to ensure that that information and support is there. It's then the responsibility of local authorities to ensure that that is disseminated effectively uh, to schools. It then becomes the responsibility of head teachers, and it then becomes the responsibility of principal teachers and faculty heads. The issue about, I mean, I don't think we should be using this to fight old battles about the, the merits or not of faculty heads, but in a, in a school which operates a, a, an effective system of distributive leadership, it is not necessary for the faculty head to attend the support uh, meetings in all subjects. They can delegate that to others as long as they have overall uh, management responsibility. Um, if there had been a major failure in communication and in the support available, then we would not have seen the results from the first set of national qualifications, which we did. And I'll just end on that note. Yeah, Graham. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Convener. I think, um, you know, we've obviously provided the, the course notes and materials written by teachers for other teachers um, that Larry described, and we're very open and welcome any feedback on any that could be refined or changed or improved further. And in fact, this year we are revising that suite. We've published... Um, as agreed uh, with the CFE Management Board and Implementation um, Group, ma course materials for, for all the new hire courses. And again, listening to feedback, we also produce route maps through the material because what teachers wanted was to know, well, which documents do you need to look at and in which order? So they gave a kind of route map through the sequence um, that teachers would need to go through in, in order to, to move towards uh, the, the new courses. So I think... In, in the paper that we've provided, we give one example of the sciences, and you can see the extent of support there, as well as web-based materials, um, local meetings, joint events with professional associations and the SQA. It outlines the huge range of national support um, that was provided. And, of course, it's worth remembering that that support is agreed by all the partners through the Curriculum for Excellence Management Board and annually through the implementation plan. So there's discussion and agreement about 
about what support is required in the year ahead, and then that's delivered um, as well as possible by, by all concerned. I think what we've learned in, in the last year or so is some of the support that was most valuable, as, as, as uh, colleagues have outlined, is that dialogue. So we're extending our programme of visits to individual secondary schools where inspectors and senior officers enter a dialogue about the curriculum because, remember, the curriculum is built at individual school level. So between August and December, we're visiting another 50 individual secondary schools to have that discussion about where they've reached, what they need next, to provide that tailored support because we continue to offer, as well as all the generic support, tailored support to any individual secondary school um, or, or department that needs it. It. And with the, the course materials and the support materials, there's a very fine balance to be struck because teachers don't want prescription. You remember, Curriculum for Excellence was to give them more autonomy and more professional freedom, but they do want practical support. So it's a balance to be struck in the nature of the materials to provide that practical support, to provide examples for, for, from other schools and other local authorities, which we're doing, but not to actually prescribe you must do this um, and so on. So we've got to all, as we've agreed, hold on to the principles of Curriculum for Excellence, um, which are built um, around that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Richard, did you want to come in here? Yes, Teachers don't want prescription, um, but they want to know what they're doing. They want clear guidelines. They want uh, Teachers have been developed over the years. The vast majority of secondary teachers particularly have got a content, they've got syllabus, they've got you know all that stuff there for them. And suddenly they're having to reinvent a lot of this themselves. And that's an experience that they've not gone through in the past. So, so in order to change that, I think that's going to take time. And I think it's, it's brought to a head last year and this year, and possibly next year, that an awful lot is having to be done for the first time. And they don't have the, the clear hooks on which to, to, to hold on to as they're doing that. So there is a, a real anxiety about that. Uh, I, I heard that we were talking about support. Um, our, our figures, we had about 1,500 responses, which is a really high proportion of our membership. Um, and we, we looked at satisfaction with Education Scotland, SQA, the local authority of their own and also their own school. And although all of these improved slightly, they were still very, very high. Um, they were still in the, you know, 80% dissatisfaction was the kind of figure we're talking about, in some cases 90%. So... Teachers are not happy with the way things are at the moment. They feel they need more support. They need more examples of things to look at and model their own practice around. They need more practice papers so they can see what's likely to be asked of their pupils at the end of the day. They need the, the, the assurance that things aren't going to change halfway through the session. We have many people who had, who had done something, had taught something, and then the rules changed, and they had to redo it, which is totally time-wasting and dispiriting. Um, they need examples of assessments that they can have as well. What I would say is that the results we got last year, which were very commendable, are probably in spite of the lack of support. And it's more a, a, a tribute to the sheer industry and determination of teachers to get through the course to make the best of what they had. And, and I'll let you think about that. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Uh, Janet. Yeah, can I develop a little bit on the point that Larry made about the, uh, the, the verification process? Because that's one of the really key changes in, in the approach to assessment in uh, Curriculum for Excellence. Um, and what we've done is, um, in, in partnership with the Curriculum for Excellence Management Board and all members of it, we agreed that we would train nominees from every local authority um, and actually train more than we needed to actually deploy to be able to understand the nature of the assessments, the nature of the, the, the work that they were going to have to be doing, that they would come in, they would be trained, they would then be used as verifiers to actually verify the internal assessment that was ongoing in schools. Um, the plan was then to have those nominees go back into the system and have them train their, their fellow teachers on, on the nature of the assessment, the nature of the changes, etc. As, as has been said, some... First year is always hard for everyone, and some of the people were not confident in terms of being able to uh, to take that next stage. We got very positive feedback on the training that we that we provided, and people actually really believe they fully understood the nature of the change in the assessment methodology. 
what we need to do is take um, the, the best practice examples that exist across Scotland where some local authorities have used their nominees in a very constructed way. They've, they've had a mechanism by which they will pull them together. They will talk amongst themselves in terms of subject areas. They will, they will hold twilight sessions for teachers to be able to share their understanding and share their, their knowledge. That is a mechanism that we all agreed would, would happen. And I think the first year is always difficult. The second year will be better. The second year includes hires, and I think that will be more proactive. In terms of support as well, one of the things that we learnt in the first year was um, that teachers were starting to understand the standards. They were getting more comfortable with them. They, they were able to demonstrate that they could assess to standard. So we changed the methods by which we were undertaking verification for the second two rounds of last year, for the last round of last year. And we've changed how we're approaching verification this year. So the first session of our quality assurance process, which is currently underway, is actually doing understanding standards training for all of those nominees so that they are fully confident on what the standards are, what the assessment methodology is, so they can then go back and share that with their, with their colleagues within the school sector. And I think it's taking advantage of that that's very, very important. The, the only other thing I, I would like to add to what we've said before is it is really important that teachers do know what's changed and do know what's the same so they can use what they've been doing historically. So the idea of publishing points of change for the new topics, whether it's National 5, National 4, or whether it's for the new hires, we have published these are the points of change, these are the points of, of stability from one set of qualifications to a new set. So it gives the teachers a framework in which they can actually target those areas that they need to um, potentially understand a little more in terms of the big changes taking place, particularly for the new hires as they come in. Okay, thank you. I'm going to bring in Jane, because I know she's got a supplementary at this point. Yeah. Jane Baxter. Thanks. Um, Given the amount of, of financial commitments and indeed other commitments that were made to the implementation of, of the new um, qualifications, can Education Scotland or the SQA justify the, the, the fact that teachers are feeling so unsupported um, and are they confident that, that there will be an improvement in that? Will, will that improve in, in the years to come? Can I come straight back to you, Janet, on that? Yeah, I, I, I think we have provided very good support as has been said it's more support than has ever been provided for any change in education in Scotland um, I think the challenge is to make sure people can access it that people can use it that people can ask questions that there that there is communication so I think I think the support is there and it's it, it is always difficult the first year of any change for anyone especially in education because teachers care so passionately about the future of their students it, it is very very difficult and I think um, a lot of what we've seen this year is as a result of that passion that teachers hold. And as they move forward, they become more confident. I think the support will be more easily accessible to them. Thanks. Yes, I, mean, I, I, would, I would agree with Janet. I think um, you know, there was continually a process of listening and changing, providing further support. <clears throat> all the commitments for support that were agreed by all the partners through the management board and the implementation group were delivered. In addition, there was a lot of further support given, so the route maps through assessment I referred to was part of the, 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 the additional support package um, that was provided there. And again, it's been about signalling to teachers where there's examples of good practice and making sure they can access support both from the local and, and national materials. I think moving forward, looking at the, the, the new hire again, there was a, 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 you know, the government and agencies and so on listened to the voice of teachers and there was therefore a phasing in of the new hire and we know that this year there'll be a mixed picture of uptake and it's quite, we've been analysing the subjects where there's less uptake of the new hire and providing additional support for those subject areas. So that's computing, science, jog, um, physics, chemistry and biology. So again, we're tailoring additional support in those subject areas where there's most changes um, in content to provide 
um, support for, for teachers. So th there is a, a full package of support there which is available in subject areas and also tailored support um, to those who need it. And as I say, the most successful types of support we found as well as the materials was actually going into individual schools and having dialogue. Um, and uh, you know, by uh, February of, of uh, 2015, we'll have been in about 177 of the secondary schools to, to offer that dialogue and that discussion and see where they are and, and what they need next. Okay. Just to make the point, Convener, um, Graham referred to commitments being delivered in full, and the commitment was made for course materials to be the new National 4 and 5 qualifications to be developed nationally and distributed to schools well in advance of the commencement of the new qualifications in 2013-14. And yet the EIS are still saying that um, course materials are less than fully fleshed out. So there's, there's obviously still a difference of opinion about, about what these commitments meant in practice. We'd be very, we, we've said to the EIS and we have a lot of dialogue um, with them, we're keen to know which specific subjects, which specific materials they think could be of better quality, because as I say, they were commissioned and written by teachers for other teachers. They've been the, one of the most successful aspects of our online service. I mean, that area of our website has had 83,000 visits. Um, at the point of, of August 14, so they have been extensively accessed by secondary teachers. The secure area and GLOW had um, 20, over 22,000 unique visits. So the material has been very extensively used. We've had a lot of positive feedback. What we need to know, if there are concerns about individuals, is which subjects, how could they be refined, how could they be improved, and we'll continue to engage with teachers who, who write these for us to work with them to provide um, further improvements there. Just two quick points, uh, convener, on the issue of resource. Um, I do want to challenge the notion that, that Terry and Janet have suggested that this has been the best resource ever curriculum development. Now, I suppose technically that might be true if you think about the scale of curriculum for excellence. It's a 3 to 18 programme, so it's touching every single aspect of education. So in terms of scale, it probably does uh, tip the balance in terms of uh, overall expenditure. But if you look back at other developments like Standard Grade, which was about a two-year course, SES4, or even higher still, which was about a fairly narrowed range of qualifications, proportionately, uh, I would say this has not been resourced uh, to the, the kind of uh, accolade that, that, that we're hearing. Terry was a teacher in the 80s, as was I, and you had Standard Grade units coming out your ears. Right? Just about everybody in the west of Scotland spent a week at Sea Mill producing uh, course materials. So, And there was a much, much greater phase-in period for both higher still uh, and for standard grade. And that's been one of the challenges because the single biggest resource that, is, that has been missing is time for teachers to actually assimilate the material and have that professional dialogue around implementation. And that time has been squeezed because we've been working to a timetable, which we've always challenged in terms of uh, implementation for this particular group of uh, S4 pupils. So... Uh, you know, and I realise we're not going to get agreement on this, but there would, you know, we would challenge the issue of resources. Uh, uh, but more particularly, the, the the key issue for us is is the time for people to actually uh, have the the dialogue in schools. What specifically? What specific subjects? What specific points are less than you would want them to be in terms of the subjects? He, he, made, he made that specific point just a moment ago. What's the answer to that question? Um, well, I, I understood we'd actually shared most of this with Education Scotland already because there have certainly been some subject areas where people have been expressed very uh, clearly that what they got was a set of uh, guidance notes rather than fleshed out courses. Um, off the top of my head, uh, computing seemed to be one that, that, that rings a bell. Um, the, uh, my own subject, English, there were issues around uh, some of the, uh, the material there. But I'm, I'm quite happy to go back and have a, a, a dialogue with uh, with Graham around specific issues. Yeah. As, as, Larry, as Larry said earlier, convener, uh, I was in Education Scotland at the time and, and was responsible for creating the 95 sets of course materials for National 4, National 5. Now, uh, I think there were a number of issues. One was that in some of those courses there were a range of options where it simply wasn't possible 
to uh, get materials produced because individual schools or individual departments weren't doing those. So there were certainly some areas where the options weren't covered. I think the other thing that needs to be borne in mind is that whilst Larry referred to standard grade and higher still and the packages of fully fleshed out materials, in many schools these were actually never used because teachers either had resources themselves that they wished to use or materials that they had used in previous uh, courses that they felt were more appropriate for their own particular circumstances. So I, I think the issue really was twofold. One was I think there was a, a difference in expectation of what fully fleshed out materials looked like. Uh, and I think for some teachers that was to receive the packages that they received under Higher Still, uh, which, as I say, you know, to the end of Higher Still remained in packed cellophane wrappers on their shelves. But I think the other issue, and it came through in discussing, particularly with teachers for the Reflections Report, the extent to which individual departments and local authorities were prepared to share materials and resources. I was very aware uh, in my previous existence with the responsibility for creating those National 4-5 materials that there were courses being developed in individual schools, some of them very high quality, which individual teachers themselves weren't prepared to put into a national pot. And indeed, as we said earlier, there were a number of local authorities that chose not to participate in this exercise of trying to bring together a collation of resources which in, in themselves would have increased quite significantly the amount of material that was available to teachers themselves. So I think there is more behind that than simply the, the fact that uh, there, were, there were inadequate resources. Uh, one second. I'm going to bring in Tavish Scott at this point. And can I welcome Tavish to, I think it's the first meeting... Uh, you've attended of the Education and Culture Committee. Can I just ask, have you got anything relevant to declare before you? Uh, Convener, first, do apologies for being late. Uh, no idea on Dalton having children in school, which seems uh, somewhat uh, relevant to this. Um, can I ask just one supplementary on this area, uh, following Jane Baxter's question? Um, I, re I was reading the RSE uh, submission on a plane coming down this morning from home, and it says in the context of the Management Board's Short Life Working Group that uh, there, that, that proposes many actions to address, but, quote, there is little discernible priority among the long list of actions. I wonder if the panel has any reflections on whether that matters or not moving forward. Who wants to? Graham. Yeah, just to say that um, through the Curriculum for Excellence Implementation Group, we've been working on a, an addendum to the implementation plan for this year to absolutely take account of um, most immediately the, the short-term actions for what we need to learn this year. So we've been collaborating with partners, the SQA, the National Parent Forum for Scotland, to populate that addendum with the actions that need to happen um, to, to achieve the recommendations in the report and the timescale for that. And that draft addendum is now been circulated to members of the implementation group and other stakeholders, including those here uh, yesterday, and we would hope that um, over the course of uh, the next week or so that will actually be published. So there's been dialogue between national partners on how we actually prioritise those actions. <clears throat> As we said earlier, quite a number of them are already um, in place, um, are already moving forward, but uh, probably one of the, the, the biggest issues about how we continue to support schools to reduce the amount of assessment um, that's taking place is in there. So there's a draft addendum to the implementation plan for this year, which will be published shortly to outline exactly how we'll work together to achieve those recommendations. Uh, Terry. Um, just uh, to go back to the, the previous question and, and Larry's reference to um, standard grade and higher still, um, I have no doubt that there was. I remember some of the support that was given. Whether it was effective support at that time uh, or not is, I think, open to question. And uh, as has been said, a lot of the stuff remained on the shelves. And one of the things, I suppose it goes back to a point that Richard made earlier, uh, which is about the nature of the support for developments in Curriculum for Excellence. Part of what Curriculum for Excellence is about is about changing the culture in Scottish education. Um, the whole system, including teachers, identified that in 5 to 14 in standard grade and indeed in higher still, there was far too high a level of prescription. And I think that one of the, the, the issues for teachers is that perhaps in some cases they have expected something which they didn't get, but they didn't get it for good reason, because the sort of support that people want, uh, uh, that people should be looking for at the moment is support which allows the, uh, the teacher and the department to develop uh, the course in a way that's appropriate to the young people that they serve. And one thing I think that's important in any new implementation, 
I think at the times that teachers have complained most about workload have been the introduction of higher, of uh, higher still, the introduction of standard grade, and now this first year, last year, of national qualifications. And one of the key things that's missing, inevitably, by definition, in the first year of any implementation is one of the most powerful pieces of support for teachers, which is sample scripts of youngsters that have actually completed the course. Now, defini by definition, you can't have that in the first year of a new set of qualifications. By, next, by this year, we have that. And I think that that is one of the key things that will increase the confidence of the prof profession and convince people that they do understand the standard. Uh, Ken. Yeah, I, th I think uh, although the, the report, uh, the reflections report, contains 36 specific actions for this coming, this academic session, and a further 19 longer term, I, mean, I chose to write them in sufficient detail that there was no doubt as to what was required from the various national bodies that uh, could support the, the, the moving forward of the, of, of the Curriculum for, El, uh, curriculum for Del, uh, Excellence initiative. And I think that uh, it may look like a long list of things that still need to be done, but uh, I would go back to what was being es echoed earlier by colleagues. I think the system itself has learned a lot from that, and I would suggest that if those short-term and longer-term actions are implemented, then we'll certainly be uh, much more successful than perhaps we have been in some aspects of delivering uh, Nationals 4-5 in year one. Barry. Yeah. The, um, the working group was fairly clear that uh, some of the immediate actions required would, would be about addressing the workload concerns um, and you know the verification changes for example do directly uh, look at that issue uh, I think we're also we were collectively conscious of uh, not wishing to create any additional uh, instability by making too many changes just as people were starting to uh, get to grips with it but there are certainly some which are I think more urgent than others um, the, we have long argued that the, there's a design flaw basically between higher and national five in that there is an insufficient fallback from higher to national five for, for students, particularly those students who are bypassing lower level qualifications and not necessarily sitting exams in S4, which again is one of the concepts that, that should develop um, as, as the education system becomes more comfortable with the, the bigger notions. So I, I think the I don't think there's a, an immediate concern about the fact that there's a timeline around some uh, longer uh, scale uh, changes, uh, as long as it, we are addressing the issues. Uh, you know, I think that's important that they're not just in there as window dressing. These are actually actions that need to be, that are required to, to support the system, um, and and that I think would be that I think would be uh, uh, beneficial. The uh, I'm really tempted to get into an argument with Terry, but I'll resist it. <laughs> point, Mr. Muir's point and, and Mr. Flanagan's, but uh, presumably you concede that 36 uh, actions are quite a lot of actions. Someone in some bit of this system has to make a judgment about which of those 36 is going to be implemented first, second, third, and all the way down. You can't expect, presumably, a head of faculty or a head teacher to make a choice that all 36 are equally important. And I just want to gauge how you expect the system to cope with so many recommendations. A lot of them are actually interlinked. Yeah. Some of them can't be discreetly implemented. They okay. have to go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think if you look at the list, mm. um, they are very appropriately, in my opinion, assigned to the different aspects of the system mm. that they apply to. And so you don't have 36 for one particular area of the system. And I think that's why it's manageable, because I think what, what, what Ken's group did was identify the, the, the particular things that that SQA needed to do, that Education Scotland needed to do, that schools needed to do, that local authorities needed to do, as a high priority for this year to make sure that this year is uh, is a, a successful year. So I, I don't think we should look at 36. It, it is very much around what do we need to focus on, what does local authorities need to focus on, what do the schools and the teachers need to focus on. And, and I think that those are manageable, and they, they are. it is very important that we coordinate across the different parts of the system, though. So it's not individual sets of actions. It's 
keeping that partnership going, making sure that we work together for the benefit of the learners, because some of the things that we need to do, we need a reflection from local authorities and we need a reflection from the teachers and the, and the, and the school leadership. So it, it's about making sure that the overall is, is delivered, but I don't think it's a list of 36 for everyone. Yeah, there are 36 specific bullets, but I would draw a committee's attention to what I think is the most significant one beyond those, which is realising the aspiration of Curriculum for Excellence. I think we still have some way to go in terms of teachers and, in some cases, head teachers' uh, understanding of the, the basic philosophy of what Curriculum for Excellence is trying to achieve. And I think that will be uh, as demanding, in fact, uh, I would suggest more demanding, than, than some of the specific uh, action points that have been uh, allocated to individual national bodies. Okay, thank you. Claire, did you have a very short supplementary? Quick question about, obviously, um, culture change has been mentioned, and that's probably one of the, the biggest challenges in any organisation is tackling culture change. And, and, and Larry, you mentioned it in, in earlier in the discussion in this area. And also, Richard, you mentioned that... Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, but what, what I took from it was um, a lot of the, the stress that teachers are experiencing is not having confidence. So it, it's in terms of that culture change going forward, I, I want, would like to gauge from you where, where the, the responsibility for that lies, if you like. Is there any more SQE in Education Scotland can do? Is it now down to local authorities or the, is, is it actually at school level that, that, that it's going, how is that going to be fixed? I think uh, I, the, the benefit that Scotland has is our education system is partnership and each each bit of the education system is absolutely essential to ensure that we do the right thing for learners. So I don't th I think we all have a part to play in that. SQA has a part to play in it. I think the, 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 the local authorities do, the teachers do. Uh, and the, the goal needs to be that we, that we talk it through, that we really understand where, where the sort of pinch points are, for want of a better word, and that we, we do give teachers the confidence they need because the teachers are passionate about what they're trying to do. We need to do as much as possible to give them that confidence. And I do think that the confidence level has increased as a result of going through National 1 through National 5. And I think this year is, is yes, a high-stakes year because it is the higher year. So we really need to make sure that each one of us, each part of the system does play our part in making sure that we support teachers and give them that confidence. And what one of the reasons we're doing the understanding standards work that we are doing now uh, for the next, it started last week and it will continue for the next few weeks, is to provide a group of people who are more confident, who can then share that confidence with, with their, their fellow teachers and provide the information that these people have been given to teachers through the website. Okay, thank you. Uh, a very brief yeah, point, Terry. Just echo what uh, Janet said about the, the, it being the responsibility of, of everyone. Um, culture change cannot come solely from the top or from national bodies. It has to be something that everybody buys into. And I think uh, local authorities and schools have got a very important role to play in that. And if we go back to what I said in my opening remarks, the challenge of creating a true 3 to 18 curriculum, part of that is about the way that we structure within local authorities how we develop things. So we have largely abandoned the idea of the, of the school cluster, which is the secondary school and the primary school, and we now meet and plan in learning communities, which goes all the way through from 3 to 18. That sort of action is the sort of thing that can begin to change culture because it, cha it changes the way that people see their colleagues and see the way that they have to operate. Thank you. Um, I'm... I'm, I'm Conscious of time, we have to try and move on up. Can I just say, if anybody's got additional points we don't catch today, if you just email them to us, that would be very, very grateful to receive. Obviously, we've got the cabinet secretary next week. I want a, I've got a very specific question though about um, to the SQA, um, Janet. And it's about assessment. Obviously, the, there were a number of comments made um, in the run-up to the qualifications, such as the uh, late arrival of relevant guidance was one of the criticisms uh, that was made. Um, a point about the fact that the N4 added value assessment was being taken not by just those on borderline cases, but by, in some areas, by almost all N5 students. The number of courses people were taking eight rather than the intended five or six, a number of points with that. Accepting all of that, has the SQA taken on board some of those criticisms? And, and how are you going to respond to that moving forward into the second year of, of these qualifications and obviously the new hire? Well, one of the things we've done is we have, um, there will be no more um, 
changes to any documentation for this year. The final, final information for mandatory documents was uh, the end of the last session, and so we, we will not be changing anything. So, yes, we took the feedback that said, um, please don't change anything else. The challenge, of course, is if you're trying to be responsive and you find out that, there's, that people are saying this is, this is a challenge, then we want to be able to respond to that. So there is always that delicate balance between how much do you respond and how much do you lock down. Um, we, we definitely have taken the view that uh, the documentation and the nature of the courses needs to stay stable, that we need to understand it, uh, and that we, need to be, um, that, that we need to be looking forward for that. In terms of um, the, the, the nature of the assessment, I think one of the things we absolutely need to make sure we do is communicate, as we are doing through the Understanding Standards work, for the next three years, uh, a real understanding and a real um, engagement with the teaching profession to make sure that they, they, they can get that level of competence that they need. Um, so fr from the point of view of final course documentation for National 5, that was finalised pretty early, but we did take feedback. and we would. Uh, it, it is that balance. If, if, if people are telling you there needs to be a change, we need to be able to respond to that. And we need to make it clear when we have made those changes and whether that change is mandatory or whether it's for information. Uh, and, and that is something that, again, needs to be clear. Are the SQA promising effectively greater stability and clarity going into yes. The next year? Yes. That is part of our action from well, the... I didn't question that. <laughs> but that is part of the action from the, from the Reflections Group, is that SQA um, does make our, our, our documentation clearer. And, and, and one of the things we've done, and actually I think if you look at the documentation that's come out recently, it is, it, it is clear. But Larry, I asked it for a reason, and the reason is, given that, that statement that that is the intention going forward in the next year, um, would that provide not only your members, but also the members of the other two unions represented here, um, more confidence, um, given some of the survey results from all the organisations? Well, we, we welcome the uh, the changes to verification and welcome Janet's statement there that you know the there'll be no further changes because I think uh, around the hire um, that's absolutely crucial. Um, we are uh, almost in October, you know, so these courses have been running since uh, June, um, so this, you know we can't we can't really uh, anticipate uh, being able to cope with any changes. So no, I think that will increase confidence um, and. Uh, Richard mentioned the confidence levels around the higher. That, that was one of the questions we asked, uh, how confident people are with regard to the implementation of the new higher. Now, the figure was 57% indicated a, a degree of confidence and 44% indi indicated uh, a lack of confidence. Now, I know that sounds quite negative, but that's the best results we've had uh, around any of the qualifications. You know, so it's pro it is progress, but I think the fact that there's still... So a lack of confidence amongst a significant cohort of teachers around the higher, and some of that will be a kind of a nervous response because people are, you know, well aware of the importance of the hires. Um, so it, it, it does indicate that we are making progress, but there are still challenges there. Uh, Janet wanted to come back in on this very, very briefly, and then I'll bring in Mary. Just, just a very quick point. As we, as we said earlier, until you have exemplification, I think teachers are always going to be uncomfortable, and we won't have that for hires this year. Mary. Um, can, I, can I just say that I remember in the first session of Parliament, and Tavish would remember this up to 2003, Peter Peacock was then talking about curriculum for excellence. I wasn't on the Education Committee, but I did obviously pick up and hear quite a lot that's going on. So it is quite shocking, really, that 80% of teachers are extremely stressed in the implementation of this. So can I, and also that the workload, uh, according to Larry, is unsustainable, and I appreciate that. But given the lead-in time, I think it is quite shocking. So my questions are, uh, my, I understand that for higher still in the standard grades, that they were piloted. I may be wrong, but I understand that. So tell me if I'm right, and tell me why there was no piloting of course notes, practice papers, etc., for the National Fours and Fives. Uh, my second point is um, the RSE paper, and the question... <coughs> excuse me, convener is on over-assessment. Has, oh, uh, has the over-assessment led to, and I quote from the RSE, paragraph 17, it would appear that the widespread reduction in the number of subjects studied in S4 is not the result of any conscious 
policy decision, but is the unintended consequence of national guidance. Because there's so much focus on over-assessment, has that led to a reduction in subjects? And my final point uh, 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 is, from my understanding in the early years of this, and I'm going back 12, almost 14 years, that it wasn't all about assessment, that it was all about interdisciplinary learning and what you picked up in one subject, you were able to take that uh, skills and apply it to another subject. And yet all we've heard from the minute we started at 10 o'clock is exams, 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 assessment, over-assessment, practice papers. We've actually heard nothing of what I understood that CFE was about, which was about learning one subject and applying it to another. So my, my third point is, has the whole, have we simply changed one form assessment for another with all its problems? Or have we actually, I think Ken Muir said that was the most important thing was to take on the, the principle of CFE, but in all this focus on assessment, has the whole ethos of CFE been lost? Because we're certainly not talking about it. Okay. Um, members are entitled to ask the questions they wish to. <laughs> to There's a lot in there, um, but I'll, I'll start with Terry. Um, I think that you've put your finger on a, an extremely important point and a, and a point that ADES is certainly concerned about. Um, one of the aims of, of CFE was to was to look at the, the the totality of a child's education and the totality of a young person's experience in, in, in school. Um, and I believe that there are some extremely exciting developments as far as that's concerned. And I could take you into any school uh, in Western Bartonshire and show you in practice what is going on that is, you would not have seen before the introduction of CFE. There is always a risk when we uh, introduce exams into the system that society as a whole obsesses on the exams. And I do believe that there is a, bit, that, that there is a, there is a, a major risk here in us losing sight of the big picture and of what we have achieved uh, in CFE overall, which I think is considerable. Um, the the over-assessment question is the responsibility of everybody in the system, and that includes individual teachers. Uh, because I, I do believe that there are some structural things in the system, like the requirement to do the value-added uh, unit for all National 5 pupils, which is just not the spirit of, of the development at all, um, like the number of subjects that you study in, S, uh, in S4. Um, but there are also individual responsibilities, and, and you know Janet uh, makes reference in her submission to the idea of, of teachers embracing the idea of a more holistic approach to assessment, which would in itself reduce the assessment burden. Um, there's no doubt that there has been stress in the system this year. I think I don't think even Larry would claim that his survey represents 80% of all teachers. It represent, uh, his statistics represent the percentage of people who responded to uh, the survey. And perhaps, by definition, you are more likely to respond to a survey if you are unhappy or if you're feeling that level of stress. Um, he hasn't said how many did respond, percentage of, the, of, of his members did respond to it. Um, we must respond to uh, the, the, the idea that teachers are under stress. We must find ways within the system to reduce the, the workload. I think everybody around the table acknowledges that that is a significant issue. Um, and teachers themselves have a responsibility to take on board the lessons that have been put out there from SQA about some of the stuff that's coming into SQA, which is simply unnecessary and is leading to some of the stress. Yeah, um, I think, first of all, in relation to the, the time scale, uh, secondary schools largely started to engage with Curriculum for Excellence um, when the last year's S4 were in S1 and there was a kind of timetable created around that group of pupils would be the first to set the new qualifications um, and we actually argued against the notion of a timetable um, but that was that's the kind of way it's uh, developed over the next four, four or five years which which isn't I don't think a, a particularly long run in for such a major change to our qualification system. One of the reasons that we argued for a delay to the qualifications timetable was so that the, the pedagogical changes around Curriculum for Excellence would bed in across S1 to S3. 
because that has been one of the difficulties that this, this year, a number of pupils who sat their National 4, National 5 last year, uh, theoretically came through CFE, Broad General Education, but in practice they didn't, because in too many schools they made subject choices in S2 and basically had, a, had an equivalent of a standard grade course towards National 4, National 5. Now, that's one of the areas where I think there will be changes this year, um, and people will be more confident about moving towards the kind of models that do actually see a broad general education as the starting point for your, your post-15 uh, career path. Um, so that the S3 profile should be the reference point. That's the prior attainment across S1, S3. That should be the reference point for your senior phase. Um, and that's where you can look at things like my path. So I think, I think all of that will start to develop uh, in course of the system. Um, I don't accept the point that Terry and Janet have made around uh, you can't provide exemplification uh, until you've got live material. Uh, when I was a higher uh, English examiner, every paper was trialled a couple of years before it came into use. So you can generate uh, models of people's answers uh, through, through practice papers, which you can then feed into the system. Why did that not happen? Because the timetable was too compressed. Right, but, I mean, there should be no difficulty actually creating some uh, pupil-led answers in relation to higher, uh, higher practice papers, which can then be used uh, to, to, to create the exemplification, because I think that is one of the, the big areas. So I, I think the timetable has squeezed out the pilot approach, um, uh, and, uh, but alongside that, I think more could be done to address that particular issue. Uh, and the last point is... Um, I'm slightly concerned at, at, at a couple of things that Terry said there because our survey, health and wellbeing survey, was answered by 7,500 teachers. Uh, it was carried out by an independent research company who said it had a validity rating of 99.1%, which is probably higher than any of the recent polls we've all been obsessing about in terms of its uh, validity. Um, and within that, the, the, the teacher workload level, the stress levels, uh, are quite clearly documented in relation to in the secondary sector, the qualifications. One of the good things going forward uh, for the higher is that the Cabinet Secretary allows teachers in schools to make professional decisions around their readiness for the new hire. Um, and I think that's taken a bit of heat out of the situation because where people didn't feel they were confident about moving forward to the new hire, they're stuck with uh, right, the, right, the old hire. Um, and it's a hire as a hire. In the ADES submission, that has been moaned. You know, that, that we haven't gone full tilt for implementation of the new hire this year. And that concerns me because that doesn't seem to be taking on board the fact that you need to give teachers control of this process in order for it to be delivered as effectively as possible. So, and I, so I think there are, there are a lot of issues there around the time scale and the compression that's created. And it's back to the, 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 the issue I mentioned before. The key resource is having time for professional dialogue at school level. Thank you. Um, I, I'll bring you back in, Terry, but very briefly. Can I just say to everybody, we're going to have to shorten the answers because we're, we're going to rapidly run out of time and not get through some of the subjects we want to do it. So can I have Ken and then Graham and then Janet and then Terry? Uh, just two points, convener. I mean, I think one uh, I referred to earlier, the fact that this is the first time ever in Scottish educational history that we've tried to change the whole 3 to 18 curriculum at one time. And I think one of the reasons perhaps why there wasn't piloting unlike standard grade and higher still was simply the fact that those were bite-sized <coughs> chunks of the 3 to 18 curriculum. And what we're trying to do is to get that seamless learning or a notion of seamless learning throughout the whole of primary and secondary. So that is why it has been around for a while. And it's only, as Larry suggested, in the last couple of years that it's really come into the, onto the radar of, of, of secondary teachers with the, uh, the, the looming examinations. I think the, the questioner also pointed to, I think, what is an issue, and that is that we still have a number of schools, as I suggested in the report, who have to think seriously about what an S1 to S3 broad general education is about and what a, an S4 to S6 senior phase is about and what the articulation between those two uh, actually is. And that one of the reasons, certainly in some schools, why there was additional pressure was the continuation of eight subjects as opposed to looking at how you can create a curriculum, particularly in the senior phase, that delivers the aspirations of curriculum for excellence and recognises the wider achievement that the curriculum can offer, as opposed to simply, important though it is, passing examinations. 
go back to Miss Scallon's point about have we lost TFE? I mean, absolutely not. As I said at the start, there's been a transformation in learning and teaching in Scottish schools. If you look at the inspection evidence and the key strengths from secondary schools in this year, you know, we've seen the, the, the key strengths most commonly in the inspections are young people who want to learn and achieve, the support of learning environment, pride in the school, leadership of the head teacher, the broad range of achievements, greater range of wider achievements that young people have had the opportunity to, to gain before. So it's been a challenging year, and yes, there, there have been issues with assessment, but undoubtedly our curriculum focuses on the experiences and the outcomes, and the experiences of young people in Scottish schools is being transformed, and there, that, that's the independent evidence to support that. Um, in terms of the, the BGE, we recognise that that is something that needs further development um, you know, most secondary schools this year are looking again at the nature of S1 to 3 and we've produced a toolkit for improving the curriculum, learning from the, the best practice in schools across Scotland that's really clear and concise and it's been very um, well received. We're also doing the same at primary level because I think it's important to remember it's not just about the senior phase. Um, we've seen uh, huge amounts of progress in the primary sector with CFE. At the moment we're in the process of seeing lots of primary head teachers over a course of national events, we'll have seen about 800 by next week. And again, we're looking at progression within the primary curriculum. And there's again a new toolkit to learn from all the best practice we've seen to date to take it to that next stage to achieve what we all want to achieve, which is a seamless uh, 3 to 18 curriculum for Scottish young people. answered yet and that is why there's been a widespread reduction in the number of subjects studied so I wonder if the remaining uh, witnesses would mind addressing that um, I, Can I leave that one for a little while uh, I, I'd like to address the one that you brought up about interdisciplinary learning uh, because I think one of the things that we were trying to do in terms of defining and, de and, and developing the new qualifications was to enable teachers to be able to um, teach their subjects in different environments and to be able to, to take advantage of interdisciplinary learning. And one of the things that we've done in terms of the internal assessments and the course assessments is allow pupils to be able to learn through projects, through assignments, through problem solving, and, and even portfolio work to be able to put together a wide variety of different uh, contexts in which they're learning things that does allow that flexibility and does allow the interdisciplinary learning that is at the core of, uh, of CFE and I think that's very 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 critical. Um, the the over-assessment I think was less about the number of subjects and more about the um, the added value unit, uh, I, I think, uh, again, because it was the first year, because there, there is um, a, a concern in teachers on, on making sure they do the right things for their students, there was a huge variety in the number of presentations for the added value unit for National 4, varied across the country very, very significantly. And I think that is, uh, that is something that I think the, the system will learn from. And, and the system, I think if you talk to teachers this year, they, are, they have learnt from last year. And, and I think we'll see a, a lower presentation for the added value unit for those, for those pupils who do not need to take the added value unit. OK, thank you. Um, Ted. Thank you. Uh, Chair, uh, first of all, uh, just two points that Larry was making. Can I just uh, reassure committee that I am not suggesting that stress levels and workload within, uh, within the teaching profession is not an issue. I, am, I have acknowledged repeatedly that that is a, uh, a significant issue which we have, to, we have to address. Secondly, the paragraph that, that, that uh, Larry refers to in the, uh, 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 in the ADES submission does not bemoan the fact that there's a, there's a mixed economy of hires. It acknowledges that that's the fact. Uh, it acknowledges the reasons for that, but it indicates that, that the profession needs a period of stability, and we will only achieve full stability in order to be able to reflect when we are operating to a single set of qualifications. I would have thought the EIS would welcome that day when we can stand back and, and look at that. With regard to Ms Scanlon's question about the number of, of uh, uh, courses being taken in S4, I think that one of the things that uh, CFE did was it re-emphasised one of the strengths of Scottish education, which is the broad general education, and it redefined that. So that goes from 3 to 15. But it also placed a greater, uh, a greater responsibility and a, a greater emphasis on the depth of learning. 
And most schools and most local authorities took the view that if the depth of learning was going to be improved, then the number of subjects would reduce in S4. And that allows, for instance, for schools to timetable S4 to S6 as a single entity. Um, and that's got some interesting consequences. I've, within my own local authority, Western Bartonshire, we've got a couple of schools that have already done that. And that means that if you timetable S4 to S6 together, you can have S4 to S6 in the same classes. So that one school in an area of significant deprivation presented two S4 pupils for higher physics, and they both get A passes. Under the previous system, that would not have been possible. So it's to allow that flexibility and to allow that depth of learning which feeds in uh, to uh, post-school learning as well. OK, um, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm keen to move on because we've got not enough a lot of time. Like Neil. Um, I've got a couple of questions on, on workload issues and, and support issues. Um, the first one is, why was the verification uh, process scheduled to be carried out so near to the end of the course, clearly that caused a great deal of anxiety um, amongst teachers. And also in terms of support, um, why did the implementation go ahead um, without adequate um, number of practice papers according to kind of teachers? Um, I also know that it's caused kind of concern amongst uh, parents and pupils as well. Um, in, in terms of the, the, the verification at the very close to the end of the course, that verification was actually a course assessment verification, so that so the students had to have studied the entire course to be able to undertake the course assessment, and and that is what the verification was about. So the, the timing was was determined by the fact that it needed to be at the end of the of the course. So I think that's 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 a critical component. What we've done is we've looked at the sampling uh, based on the the information that we got from last year's. Uh, verification process, quality assurance process, uh, we are able to adjust our sampling methodology because we are seeing an increased number of schools that are operating at standard and therefore we can reduce the sampling mechanism. So we've looked at that to try and um, address some of the some of the workloads. But the, the timing has to be there for, from the point of view of the course assessment. Uh, in terms of uh, practice papers, the um, what we've done is we've provided a practice paper um, for uh, National 5. We uh, have committed to provide an additional higher um, practice paper this year. The writing of a practice paper is extremely complex because it needs to reflect exactly what the students will actually see when they sit down for an examination. So it is a very complex activity. But, but what we've done in addition to that um, commitment to provide an additional one is we have uh, again highlighted from past papers those questions that teachers can use uh, that are relevant again part of the points of stability points of change uh, components so the teachers have more of a, a of a suite of questions that they can use as part of their internal assessment to get pupils ready for the examinations Does anyone get any other comments on that? Um, I'd, I'd like to ask the, the primarily the teaching unions. Um, how how easy or difficult uh, do you feel it's been to get the the voices of teachers heard during this implementation process against the pressure from or the possible pressure from the Scottish government and others to implement um, the the timetable um, as as promised. Okay. And um, can I ask? So you can I add another one. Just. Um, it's been raised that, um, by the teaching unions that teachers need more time. Um, is it the case that, um, would you say that we also need more teachers? Okay, um, Richard. Uh, um, I think the very fact we have a committee like this means that we are much closer to government and to decisions than in many other parts of the United Kingdom. So I, I think it is relatively easy to make our voice heard from that point of view. Okay. Whether it's listened to is another matter, but certainly I think we have the, 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 the platform in which we can do that. Um, in terms of time, as you know, uh, schools operate with a working um, t time agreement which allocates hours every year, and, and that's divided up into various activities within the school. We as a union have tried to encourage our 
school representatives to increase the time available within that for the introduction, particularly in the, the senior phase of uh, curriculum for excellence, but also in, in the broad general education phase as well. And there's been a reluctance to allow that time to be made available. So it's pushed an awful lot more time into teachers' own time. So I, I think that the working time agreements have to be much more realistic. I think head teachers need to be given the authority and the power not to put everything into that, but to create freedoms, particularly over the next two years, to allow the development of this. But, and the other thing we've got to think about is it's not just looking forward, we also have to look back. And teachers this year are obviously focusing, in almost all cases, on presenting the new hire or getting ready for the new hire next year, and also the new advanced hire next year. Very little time is available to look back at what happened with National 4 and 5, and many teachers feel that that needs to be improved, it needs to be modified, it needs to be closer in, in line with expectations, uh, particularly if they've had difficulties with verification and so on. So that time has virtually been ignored at the moment, so there is a huge amount of time required, and I don't think that time is being made available. And yes, more teachers would always be good. If that wasn't a leading question, Larry, I don't know what was. Uh, Jane. Thanks, convener. Um, in terms of the voice of the profession, I think being part of the management board has certainly allowed us to take forward the views of, of the profession. In fact, that's where the bureaucracy uh, working group came from, was our unions bringing forward physical examples of just how ridiculous the level of bureaucracy was. So I think that's a positive like Richard, I'm not sure it's always listened to, and, and part of what's concerned me this morning is that we talk about all the levels of support that are available, but if there are still such a high percentage of teachers expressing concern, then that has to be that has to be paid attention to, whether it's because they don't know the support is there or whether it's just because they feel unsupported. I think it is a genuinely uh, uh, important issue to be focused on. In terms of time, I mean, what... Uh, <laughs> Time is where do you get time from? But one of the, the uh, groups that we haven't actually spoken about this morning is uh, supply teachers and the whole gamut of issues around supply cover uh, to allow people out, but also um, the supply teachers as a group because they very largely feel out of the loop and they, they're the people that are going to bring in uh, the ability to release time in order to take things forward. I mean, I'm, I don't want to be the voice of doom all the time and I feel I kind of am on these things and I suppose that's the role of the union sometimes. And, and we've always supported right from the beginning this curriculum change. We think it's a fantastic way to move forward for Scottish education. Um, but it's not in its own little bubble, and all these other issues impact upon that. And the real concern, again, about not listening to the voice of the profession is the success of last year, as you've acknowledged, was largely due to the commitment of teachers, and they're just not going to keep on doing this. I can't urge you to, to see that more clearly. You know, they're underpaid, they don't have the supply support, and... The, the physical national support needs to be more clearly laid out for them. But unless things are moving forward, and we are moving them forward together, um, it's, it's not going to continue in that way. So. Thank you very much. Larry. Um, when I'm speaking for of Scotland, I always make great play of the fact that we have a, a social dialogue around education in Scotland, um, which is you know, absent in uh, uh, other parts of, the, of these islands. So... I think we, we, we do have a number of platforms where we can actually express the opinion of the profession and we have a number of robust partnerships. Where I think there are two, two difficulties around that is that we have national policy in terms of the Scottish Parliament, but we have responsibility for implementation in terms of the local authorities. Uh, and I think sometimes there's a little bit of a gap. Um, and you know, we, we engage in national discussions, but quite often some of the issues that we have... Uh, concerns around are to do with how individual education authorities are approaching an issue. Um, and we don't have a good working relationship, or we don't have an effective working relationship with, with COSLA's Education Committee, for example. Um, they, in, in a sense, they default to IDES in a lot of areas, you know, and we do, we do meet with IDES. But again, IDES don't control their individual authorities, they're, they're a professional network. So I, so I think that is, that's one of the areas where there's a little bit of a gap. Um, the other, and we've been fairly clear about this, is we think SQA has to be more accountable to the system. 
Uh, and that was a big focus of discussion at our AGM this year, and we've written to the Cabinet Secretary with a number of suggestions. Uh, because whilst it's important that SQA have a, an independence, in one sense, in relation to you know the uh, its, it's, uh, its credibility in terms of being the custodian of, of the standards, uh, we think there should be greater direct links between professional voice and the, the operations of SQA. The, the last, on the second point, um, we, are, we have a, a body of evidence that we're going to be taking to the Tackling Bureaucracy Working Group, which is reconvening um, shortly under the convenership of uh, Alistair Allen, the Schools Minister, um, around how uh, working time agreements and school improvement plans have to be realistic in terms of how they, they assess the, the amount of work that is required. And uh, uh, just a very small anecdote, I, I was at a Speaking to my, my head teacher, my, my former head teacher uh, in a Glasgow secondary school, who, who's a good EIS member, and he told me that he, he had stood up on the first in service day at the start of term with a school improvement plan on the projector, and he just picked out four things and said, These are suspended until further notice because this year we are focused on delivering the new qualifications, and we're a, a two year uh, qualifications route, so nobody in S4 sat qualifications. And that was quite a dramatic move, and I, I double-checked it with a couple of colleagues in case he was just spinning me a line, but he did actually do it. Um, and that's the sort of thing that needs to be done. There needs to be a real, realistic assessment of, if this time is needed in order to ensure that this programme is delivered, identify the time and put other things to the side. And, and I've been saying this to our workload campaign meetings, unless you actually stop doing something, you'll never reduce workload. Because if you keep trying to do everything, you'll just... It's a, 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 and then there's a piece of string. So I, so I think the, the tackling bureaucracy working group when they reconvenes will have a number of uh, issues to consider there in terms of how we actually address uh, some of the workload concerns. Okay, thank you. Um, can I bring in Colin Beattie at this stage? Colin. Thank you, um, I wanted to just explore a little bit more around workload. Um, clearly there's a, a general acceptance that the development of Curriculum for Excellence did result in uh, increased workload for teachers and I'd just like to, s to find out what you feel, how confident you feel that this workload will ease as Curriculum for Excellence settles in, or as I seem to interpret what uh, EIS was saying, that possibly some of that workload now is integral to the Curriculum for Excellence approach. Um, Terry? Uh, I believe that the, the workload will ease. Um, I said earlier that the, the first year of the introduction of any uh, uh, new set of national qualifications has been a time when teachers have uh, experienced significant workload. And I was a teacher during uh, the introduction of the first two of those. Um, I, th I don't think that there is anything inherent in CFE which means that workload is greater. Uh, I believe that a lot of the workload issues are to do with two things, assessment, and I think we've covered that really about the, the number of different elements that mean that, that there is over-assessment in the system at the moment, which is incidentally an issue for the workload of young people as well as for teachers. Um, and secondly, a lack of confidence in the standard. And as the confidence grows, and I think that there are strong signs, as Janet has said, that the confidence of the profession is growing in understanding the standard, then that means that you have to do less checking, you have to you become more comfortable with the materials that you're using, and it becomes part of your, your daily work. So I do believe that the, the workload will, uh, will reduce, and I also believe, to go back maybe to a point that was being made earlier, that ultimately one of the effects of CFE will be that teaching will actually become a much more rewarding job because you will be dealing with uh, a greater you'll have a greater degree of flexibility and you will be dealing with the whole child and I do agree with what Miss Scanlon says it would be a big mistake if we obsess solely on the exams and let's not forget half the half the profession are in primary schools they are not in secondary schools thank you um, Janet yeah. I mean, I, I, I do believe that the workload will go down. I think that if I talk about assessment, I think the, the, the understanding of assessment methodology, the understanding of the standards, once people get more comfortable with that, it will be, people will stop using 
individual pieces of evidence to justify individual outcomes. It will be much more about using the material that's generated through learning and submitting that to us to actually prove that this is the level of the learning that we're getting to. That's what the purpose of verification is, is to make sure that the, the teachers are assessing to standard. If they show us material that they're using on a regular basis, that can add uh, huge value, both in terms of the fact that they'll be doing that on a regular basis within the learning, and it will be also useful for us in terms of verification. I think the confidence in, in, in the, the nature of the assessment is one thing that will improve, but I also think the, the confidence of teachers and their willingness to share their information with each other will also increase, and by increasing sharing, you actually stop having each individual teacher having to do it completely one uh, individually so this year for instance we we um we did we offer a, a prior verification process which actually allows teachers to submit some of their assessments we look at it say yeah that's standard it, it, you're allowed to use that that is something that we we've been offering and we ask each of those teachers if they'll allow it allow us to share that with other teachers and not all teachers will allow us to do that. Part of that is about lack of confidence. Once teachers get confident, you'll start being, it's a bit like the point that, that Graham made, we'll, we'll build up a much bigger bank of information that teachers will be able to assess, both in terms of assessment and in terms of, of, of support materials. That in itself will reduce the workload for teachers. The um, OECD published a, a major a report a couple of weeks ago called Education at a Glance, and it highlighted the fact that Scottish teachers are amongst the most class committed teachers um, across uh, Western Europe, on average 150 hours more than uh, their colleagues in, in England, and that's a situation which is effectively deregulated. So, so I think there is a, a bigger issue around workload and simply looking at the workload related to the uh, national qualifications that have been introduced. I, mean, I quoted a figure earlier of 84% um, in terms of secondary teachers or secondary members indicating dissatisfaction with workload levels. The figure in primary is 76%. Uh, the figure in nursery is 65% and in special 62%. So there are particular pressures around workload in relation to last year's experience around national qualifications. But workload is, uh, is a much bigger issue. Uh, than simply about the qualifications. And, and I do agree that as people become more familiar with the qualifications, some of the introductory workload pressures will, will ease. But I think there is a, you know, from our point of view, there's a much uh, bigger concern there. And, and part of the concern relates to a point that, that Terry made there, because um, the, the implementation of curriculum for excellence is supposed to create a, a working environment where teachers uh, are able to flourish as professionals. Um, and when Terry and I were both on the CFE management board, we, some people occasionally used the word fun in relation to education. Um, you know, and that is, that's a big picture. But in terms of our health and wellbeing survey, the, one of the last questions we asked was, would you recommend teaching as a career uh, to, to, to other people? And only one in two teachers who responded to the survey said they would recommend it as a career. Now, that to me is hugely concerning because I think teaching is a fabulous career, um, you know, and I think it, it should, we should aspire to uh, having the best uh, candidates going into the teaching profession. But your, your best advert for, for that should be your current teachers. And if one in two are saying that because of a, a variety of different pressures, uh, they wouldn't even recommend it as a career, I, th I think that should ring some alarm bells. Okay. Thank you. Ken? Yeah, I think briefly in, in response to uh, Mr Beatty's question, I mean, I think we, we have two reports in the system just now. We have the previously published Tackling Bureaucracy report and we have the Reflections report. And I think uh, I would suggest to the committee that they should have confidence in the future that uh, not only will Curriculum for Excellence be fully implemented, but that workload will uh, reduce if the recommendations in both of those reports are, are taken forward and taken seriously. Just to say that um, we are uh, actively monitoring progress with the Tackling Bureaucracy Report. As I say, we're currently in the midst of being in front of 800 primary heads, showcasing how other head teachers have reduced the amount of planning, freed up time for teaching, reduced the amount of assessment. So the, the inspection advice note this year um, talks about consolidating where we are. It talks about 
what schools are actively doing to reduce um, bureaucracy. So again, like other colleagues, I think the workload will go down. If you look at any system in the world, when you introduce a new curriculum or new qualifications, teacher workload um, does increase. Um, but what we've got to do moving forward collectively is continue to minimise um, the amount of time teachers are spending on tasks away from, from teaching and learning. So we've commissioned some independent research into the Tackling Bureaucracy report. Our area lead officers are asking directors of education what's being done um, around this. We've also launched new progression frameworks in each curriculum area, which look at the absolute uh, steps of learning um, in, in each area. And again, that's to an attempt to reduce um, the amount of time spent planning and assessing, because we don't want to see big bulky folders um, of, of uh, planning that take teachers um, away from improving learning and teaching. So we'll continue to work with partners to take this forward um, and continue to showcase um, examples of where that's been actively taken forward. And I think just a final point to say is that we've agreed to set up new curriculum learning, teaching and assessment forums for each curriculum area, which will keep the curriculum under constant review. Um, and those include teacher professional associations, specialist interest groups and others, so that we have an ongoing dialogue about how we can refine and further improve the guidance on the curriculum and how we can uh, make content changes um, in, a, in a cumulative way to manage workload for teachers moving forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jane Baxter. I just want to ask a quick question about the process of the compiling the report of the working group on the first year of the new national qualifications. I note from the evidence that the EIS said that um, whilst they support most of the recommendations, they have a number of concerns based on their view that the analysis was neither deep nor critical enough to get to the core of the problems. And the NAS UWT said that... Um, in order to reach a consensus, the myriad of concerns raised by the unions, including workload, were omitted from the final report. Would either of, of you have comments to make about where and how those concerns might be taken forward now? Yeah. I, mean, I think the, the key concern was that um, the analysis didn't reflect what we thought were the problems. So, for, if, for example, there was an agreement that there was a, uh, an element of overassessment in the system last year, um, although I don't think people should be blamed for that because the overassessment was around ensuring that no young person fell through the gap. Um, what we would like to see in the report was an explanation as to why that overassessment took place, and our analysis was that a good part of it came from the fact that communication had been poor, so that there was a lack of understanding. So that then goes back to well, well whose responsibility was it to communicate the big messages, um, and the. Uh, there certainly wasn't agreement uh, in the working group around that. Um, you know, we would point the finger uh, to some extent at SQA um, and the CFE management board. SQA had their own view in terms of in terms of that, uh, and the the final report I think was an attempt in Ken's part uh, to, to to balance the books. We would have liked to have seen the teachers' perspective included in there, even if uh, even if it was rebutted. You know, even if uh, it simply said. The teacher unions had this view and uh, SQA responded by saying, because we think that would have, in terms of the, the, the readership, you know, in terms of uh, schools looking at it, we think that would have at least allowed people to see that their views had been represented in the report. Although interestingly, and Ken might not like this, because the report has been distributed through the General Teaching Council magazine, but in our survey, 65% of people said that they hadn't seen the report. So it tells you how many people open their magazine <laughs> again, you know. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, we just thought it'd been it'd been useful, even if we couldn't agree to have reflected the two sites. Um, although we do absolutely accept that there there was a kind of unanimous agreement around uh, the recommendations moving forward, and in a sense, that's the that's the progressive agenda. But uh, you know, given that the pressures teacher were under last year, I think um, the report could have reflected some of that um, a bit more thoroughly than it does. I know there's been some attempt to acknowledge it. Thank you. Uh, Jane? Just to echo that, I mean, our concern, I think, was that some of the details of the of the issues that we had brought back were appeared on first reading to be glossed over rather than uh, further explored and detailed. And I think our concern initially was that teachers reading it wouldn't have perceived just how much we were raising the concerns that, that, that they were bringing. Although I do think that it was useful to 
have the report agreed and the recommendations brought out so that we can move forward on having them implemented. Um, like EIS, many of our members hadn't had sight of the report and nor had they of the bureaucracy report. So that you know was an issue for us in terms of continuing to raise it. But it does make me wonder why if each teacher was meant to receive a copy of it, why they haven't actually read it, particularly as we're revisiting the bureaucracy one a year on. So that you know that is a concern. So it wasn't about the fact that the group hadn't addressed the issues. I think it was about the detail that finally uh, appeared in the in the report. Given that criticism of teachers not getting sight of the report, I don't whether Ken, would you want to comment on that? I, I, I think you know, the the purpose of using the Teaching Scotland magazine as a vehicle for getting it out to all teachers was that it's. The GTCS is the only organisation that can mail directly to all 75,000 registered teachers. So there was a, a, a feeling that it was important that teachers got this as early in the new term as possible, given that the short-term actions were required for the, the session that had just begun. I think specifically in relation to the working group, I, mean, I made a number of points very clear at the very first meeting, and that was that I was looking to produce a report that was akin to the Tackling Bureaucracy report, because it was relatively short and relatively uh, sharp. It was a report that would have as much consensus as possible. And as Larry uh, and, and Jane have suggested, it was very difficult to get a consensus around the, 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 the reflections. Uh, I think to have portrayed that in the report would have led to a much lengthier report. I was certainly very keen and I was indeed adamant that there would be no blame apportioned uh, through the report itself. I think it's also worthwhile reflecting on the fact that whilst there is an attempt to do a synthesis of the, the reflections, the individual action points themselves tell a story about what some of the reflections were in the report. And I took the view that through that uh, vehicle we would, we're more likely to arrive at actions that are, are going to lead to significant change and improvement than had we dwelt on the reflections of the previous year. So I was looking to produce a report that was very much forward-looking in order to move the system forward as opposed to perhaps dwell overly on what had happened in the last year. OK, thank you. Uh, that, that, that's very helpful. Can I just, for absolute clarity, the report was emailed out or posted out to every single teacher? Posted to all registered teachers, all 75 registered teachers. So that included primary... 75,000. 75,000, 75 would be a bit low. 75,000, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, 75,000 uh, who are registered with GTCS. It, 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 was, it was posted out with the GTCS magazine, hmm. not, not separately. Not separately, we, yes. We, we have also emailed all our secondary members with a, a hyperlink to the report. Uh, which clearly hasn't been activated by a significant number. So I'll, I'll we'll, we'll acknowledge that communication is a challenging business. <laughs> OK, th th thank you for that, uh, Neil. Um, we've obviously had concerns about workload pressures and the impact on implementing the new hires, um, particularly about teachers' ability to develop and implement the new hires, as well as um, making any possible amendments uh, to national ones. To fives. I apologise if this has already been covered. I don't think it has, but has the need for development time been factored into working time agreements? Yes, change. I was going to say it was it was supposed to have been, um, but our our uh, anecdotal, I have to say, because we haven't surveyed since a uh, previous one, um, is that at the moment very few working time agreements are being changed, and that's what's causing the problems. Maybe one of them. Uh, less than Bartonshire, uh, but yes is the answer. That it has been built in. Well, well that's interesting. I was, I was about to say, the, the issue around working time agreements is that they're school-based agreements. Mm -hmm. So it, it's for the, 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 the union representative in the school to negotiate with the senior management in the school. And then there's, there's usually a sampling by LNCTs uh, to make sure that they're compliant with the, the broad parameters. But I think we recognise that working time agreements are imperfect tools in terms of controlling workloads. Uh, the Tracking Bureaucracy report has looked at that and said, you know, working time agreements need to reflect the real time demands. Uh, and I think there's a there's still a learning curve there in terms of people actually instead of because in a lot of schools they just get nodded through. Uh, they need to actually be a genuine negotiation, a genuine evaluation of what time is actually required. And it's only if you evaluate the real time that you can create a programme that matches the time available. 
you know, if you just put everything in theory, we'll work on that, and see it just becomes a an endless agenda. Okay, uh, Richard. I'd, I'd that, uh, how do, as, as you say, Larry, the working time agreement is made up by an agreement between management and the school reps within the school. We have situations, I can name schools, none of them in Western Bartonshire, I may add, um, where a head teacher has come and says, that's your working time agreement for next year. And there's been no movement on that. And it's had to go to local um, groups to try and come to some resolution of that. Time is included in it for development time in the vast majority of cases, but I would say probably not anything like enough. That, that, should, that should change year on year. Some working time agreements are the same every single year. And, you know, they're just signed off. It's almost a case of, right, just sign this and we'll just go on with it. And it, it can make life very difficult for reps within a school if they have to be challenging this every single year. Can I, in terms of the new hire as well, I, I think you mentioned earlier the SST had done a survey where um, two-thirds uh, um, of pupils will sit in courses in new hires next year. Um, and one third will be the existing hire. Um, I was just going to ask, kind of, the rest of the panel, um, what is the, your understanding of the level to, of which teachers are proceeding with uh, the new hire versus uh, maintaining um, courses in, in existing hires? Terry. Yeah. Again, I can speak from my own authority's point of view, but also from the Curriculum Assessment Qualifications Network at ADS, which I chair, because we have actually discussed this. And I think the picture is basically that there are there are two issues. There are certain curricular areas where there has been such a significant amount of change in the courses that a large number of uh, departments are not proceeding to the new hire. Uh, in my own authority, for instance, none of the science departments are going to the, the new hire, so physics, chemistry, biology, human biology. Um, an issue as well with computing science. Um, I, in both cases, actually, I think that that's a recognition of how out of date the previous courses were and how radical the changes to the curriculum had to be in order to make those courses uh, relevant. The second uh, level of, of issue really is, is where you have a, um, a situation in a particular department where there has been a staffing issue, where perhaps there has been a, a, a series of changes in staffing or there has been long-term absence in the part of the principal teacher. And on those cases, on a subject-by-subject on -subject basis, um, the, the, they have requested and have been granted leave to, to postpone implementation for a year. That's the process that we've undertaken. We did a, a thorough survey, and I think this was reflected in most local authorities, a thorough survey of level of readiness where there was a general consensus then people did not go ahead across the authority and then other uh, cases were, were dealt with on an individual basis. But the majority are going with the new hire. Okay, Graham. Yeah, just to, to echo that, really, we've been engaged with every local authority in discussion around this um, to, to monitor levels of uptake. And as we would expect, there is a mixed picture, which is in line with um, the Cabinet Secretary outlined um, in terms of adopting uh, the new hire this year or into next. So there is, there is a mixed picture across the country. Of course, um, schools are negotiating with um, discussing with parents and with local authority officers the reasons for that around the reasons that, that Terry um, outlined. I think the, the important thing to say is that the hire remains the gold standard. Um, there will be no differentiation on the certificates and so on between which which hire you did. Um, and they'll have the same currency. They're all... Yeah, I agree, man. It's, all very, I mean, okay. it's, it's fascinating. And, but, but given the time, I think there are some specific okay. points and uh, right, Mr Ribby's quite right to ask them. Okay. When, we, when, when he, he asked, is, is it two-thirds to a third? Or is it not? Or is it, is it some, what figure would you put on in terms of new hire and old hire? It varies from local authority from 100% down to a third, I would say. So it varies ac across each local authority. A national figure, though, putting all the local authorities together is a national figure. Well, I think we'll, we'll know the exact levels of uptake around November time um, when the SQ get their well, exact data. Janet, can, I, yeah. can you help us here? Um, in, in terms of entries, um, we won't know until November who's been entered for which hire. Um, and um, we can handle whichever way uh, schools decide to go. Um, the, final, the final entry figures come out a little bit later than that, but we'll get a clear indication in November. But at this point, we don't know. Okay. Uh, I, think, I, think, I, think, I think it's important to recognise that uh, 
it won't be a local authority for local authority. It's subject by subject. There's, there's only one local authority where, from our point of view, there's been a, an ongoing issue, um, which I won't name, um, although it's a city that to say yes. Uh, so that narrows it down a bit. Um, but by and large, we think the the uh, that there was uh, by and large we think the agreement has worked well. And what's been quite interesting is the consistency across the local authorities as to which subjects people had concerns about. So the sciences, computing science, it's the same subjects that have come up in different areas. It does beg a little bit of question around the National Five experience in those subject areas, but you know that's a, another discussion. Question. <laughs> um, Claire Adamson. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, uh, earlier, uh, Mary Scanlon was asking about the original aspirations of CFE, and it, it, it's just a, if I could put this this question in context of the wider community and parents and carers. Do you think that the aspirations have been effectively communicated to parents? Do you think moving forward that the two plus two plus two model will move to a three plus three model across the country? And um, given the um, paper from the Royal Society, um, is there still a perception that reducing the number of subjects studied is a disadvantage to students? And because of those pressures from outside and because of those perceptions, um, do you see going forward that we may end up with um, local authority variations in these areas and therefore geographic variations in implementation? Graham. Thanks very much. I think... Um, the first point to make is that with the broad general education, all young people will have studied all the curriculum areas at the end of SD to a higher level than ever before. So the idea being that they can take subjects at different points and there's greater flexibility and choice um, than there's ever been before for young people to choose the right combination of qualifications and wider achievements so that by the time they leave the senior phase they've got a better package of skills achievements and qualifications overall and as we said earlier reduction in subjects in S4 um, is to allow that deeper learning and it is um, not it means that they can pick them up at other points as well so I think that's a really important point to say secondly in terms of parents nationally we've been collaborating a lot with the National Parent Forum we've produced leaflets and guidance for parents the nationals in a nutshell the revision materials, for example, in Easter, which were very well received. Parents' biggest source of information, of course, is their own school and their own teachers. So it's important that we continue to um, work with schools and teachers to build the confidence and make sure the right messages are getting to parents because we want young people and parents to have a dialogue so that each, per each young person gets the most out of the senior phase they can because there's greater scope for them, as I say, to have more choice and more flexibility than they've had in the past. Barry? Yeah. I mean, I think the direction of travel is, is positive. Um, and I think as, as parents' experience of the qualification system is the new qualifications, uh, you know, this kind of comparison with what used to be there will disappear. Although I still get people talking to me about the row, the row grades, uh, you know, so there's, there's always that kind of, that's there. I, I think w where the big area opens up for us is in relation to the, uh, the 15 to 18 journey of those pupils who previously wouldn't be engaged with uh, with the qualification framework. Because in fact, that, that group of youngsters were supposed to be the main beneficiaries of the CFE senior phrase. Uh, and that will be complemented a bit now by the, the, the work from the, the Woods Commission. But, but it's also, I think, the area which has been least developed to date because the, the focus has been on the, on the qualification uh, pathways. So, uh, and it's when you start thinking about that, that group of pupils and how you kind of narrow the gap between vocational and academic uh, and, and give them uh, parity, that's when I think you start to look at senior phase models uh, that are geared to the needs of the local communities. Uh, and that's a real... And, and, and I'm, I'm not at least a bit concerned that there'll be a variety... Uh, of post-15 experience because schools serve different communities. It won't be a variety across authorities. It'll be within authorities, there'll be a variety of different models. Um, and we've been, a, we've been a little bit fixated on eight standard grades as a, as a benchmark. Uh, my old school only ever did seven because we had an afternoon where we did activities. Um, you know, and the, the, the narrowing down to five or six, uh, well, it's probably the wrong word to use narrowing because the whole intention is that the senior phase is supposed to be a, have a breadth of experience which is beyond simply your subjects and your qualifications but might involve community volunteering. So I think all of these things are, are there in the mix and that's 
what I think we've all been talking about in terms of the big aspiration around the senior phase. Um, it's still a long way off, but the framework is there for us to move towards it, I think. OK. Sorry, Jane. Just, just a brief comment. Uh, um, I'm aware of uh, the changes to the curriculum through the work that I do, but as a parent of an 11-year-old who's just started high school, I've had absolutely no information on what to expect. And that concerns me because I know the information is there. Um, and I wouldn't name the authority, but it does concern me because I go to the meetings at the school and I go to the, you know, the familiarise yourself with the high school and all the rest. And I don't know whether there's already this assumption that because my daughter's first year, it's kind of all going to be fine. And they've been focusing on those that are going through the qualifications now. But as, as I say, as a parent of uh, a child who is going through the new system, as opposed to having had two that are in their 20s who went through the old system, it does concern me if the information is not getting to parents. I think, I think we would all share that concern. Terry? Um, could I just say that I agree entirely with uh, Larry's analysis of the current situation and of the challenges that we've got moving forward? Uh, <laughs> it's been minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, I, I think that communication with parents is, is, is crucial and is a difficult, uh, a difficult issue, and we have to maybe become more imaginative uh, about that. And one of the key reasons why it's so important is that parents have to see the advantages of the new curriculum to their child, mm -hmm. and their child might not be academic in the traditional sense. And the challenges of the, the, the Wood Commission, I think the Wood Commission did Scottish society a great favour by shining... A uh, dark light into some of the darker, a uh, bright light into some of the darker corners, um, both of education but also uh, of, of of industry. Um, and I'm on the the the, the program board for the Wood Commission, and I, I think there's a fantastic opportunity for Scottish society to really open up education so that that a three to eighteen curriculum becomes meaningful for every child in Scotland, not just for those that go on uh, to do hires. And ultimately, I suppose the last part of your your question, um, I think we will have achieved. Uh, the aims of Curriculum for Excellence, where everybody sees it as a 3 to 18 curriculum rather than, uh, you know, a broad general education and then the senior phase. But as far as the senior phase is concerned, you have to look at it as a single entity and the qualifications and experiences that young people pick up throughout that period rather than fixating, as I think the Royal Society did, on S4 as a single uh, part of that. Thank you. Uh, Janet. I think it's always a challenge to communicate to parents. Parents who are interested, it's easy to communicate with. I think that the, the challenge is to communicate to those parents that are probably the ones that we really need to communicate to, which are, which are the ones that are not as engaged in their child's education as we would like them to be. So I think that's, that's one point that I think we should ne not lose focus on. Um, I do think we forget about the fact that we also need to, to engage with employers because part of curriculum, for instance, is actually changing the nature of what children leave school with, uh, whether that's a different pattern of uh, traditional qualifications, national qualifications, or whether it's the inclusion of vocational qualifications that they've taken within the school or within school college partnerships or that they've actually engaged with employers on. And it's really important that we do really focus on how do we make sure that everyone values the achievements of young people at an SCQF level, which is a, a given level, whether it is a vocational qualification or whether it is a national academic qualification. And I think there's some really, really excellent examples of school college partnerships that are in existence where uh, pupils are going from school to college and they're starting on a vocational pathway right now. They're getting SCQF level five and six qualifications and we need both parents and employers to recognise the value of those things. And you know, we're very proud to be able to, to, to deliver all of those qualifications and it's, it's really quite concerning sometimes where we talk about SQA qualifications only as nationals. We, there is a huge breadth of qualifications that are available for all sorts of, um, uh, of skills and knowledge that um, we need to take advantage of and really make sure that kids undertaking curriculum for excellence have the ability to do what they want to do and to be able to get credit for what they can do and employers recognise it. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. 
Uh, two quick questions, one from Mary and one from Tarish. Yes, uh, I, and it is uh, very quick because uh, my question has been touched on by Messrs Flanagan and Flanagan uh, in the last few minutes, and it really is about um, moving forward to the Wood Commission. And uh, we've heard all about exams and assessment all morning, and it really is that group that would benefit from developing Scotland's uh, young workforce, which I... Uh, put on the record that of every party in this parliament is, is signed up to. We want to see it working. Uh, what I don't want to see is to wait 10 years for it to develop. And uh, th I hear words like Janet has just said, we need to take advantage of. Uh, and I heard Terry saying there are opportunities there. And my concern is that, you know, all this focus on assessment, etc., that we're not quite there yet with dovetailing uh, education and uh, uh, the, the Wood Commission, and given that the focus next year seems to be all about the higher, so that's why I focused earlier on the interdisciplinary learning, because my understanding from the early years that it wouldn't just help pupils to get hires and national fours and fives, but it would actually prepare them for the workplace, uh, and that's what I feel we're kind of losing today. And so I appreciate some some have mentioned it, convener, but what I would really like to know is what's happening moving forward and also with the further education colleges, because I know this is a big change and there are opportunities within the college as well as the schools. Um, so it was just to put that on the record. Okay. Well, I'll just say that um, during the course of the last year, we did was we also published not only national qualification results but also the awards that kids were getting uh, that where they were developing employability skills where they were doing skills work courses so it is it is already in the schools the issue is ramping up the pace of it and I think that the relationships between um, the colleges and schools and the school college partnerships that they've been developing is is something that we need to extend and that I think is a good basis for the introduction of the developing Scotland's young workforce recommendations thank you Terry um, I think that the you're right to highlight the, the importance of moving this agenda forward. Uh, in fact, I've been extremely impressed by the pace of, of uh, what has happened so far. Uh, the report was published, I think, on the 6th of June. The first meeting of the programme board was before the end of June. It has already met three times. It has got very broad representation from across Scottish society, not just the education uh, system. I have been very impressed by the fact that the, the people from industry that are on the programme board accept and understand the fact that this is part of Curriculum for Excellence. Um, they also accept that teachers cannot deliver this alone. It has to be a societal thing which involves employers. The other thing is that um, the, the aims, the, 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 the goals of the Wood Commission final report are extremely ambitious. Um, in looking to reduce the, the significantly the level of youth unemployment. And within three years, every secondary school having a partnership with industry. Um, so there is an urgency here, but I have been impressed by the way in which the government appears to have taken uh, forward uh, this agenda uh, urgently, because I think you're right that th this is the agenda that will really deliver for all uh, Scotland's young people, not just for those that go on to do hires. Yep, I would just, I would just echo that. You know, we are um, working with partners um, to develop detailed implementation plans because curriculum for excellence is about skills for learning, life, and work, and we want to really shine the light now on the work element of that. Um, we've been raising awareness with all schools at the moment <laughs> through the head teacher conferences. In our inspection advice note for this year, we're looking to see how schools are beginning to, to take this forward. So there is a real strong sense of momentum and 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 realising the aspirations. For for all young people um, and we're looking at it not just in terms of the senior phase and the, the new pathways in, involving um, colleges, we're looking at the broad general education as well and saying how can we get that focus on careers, management skills and skills for work for, for younger children as well. So there's a strong national partnership emerging around this and clear detailed implementation plans that we're working with um, I think that will be uh, launched shortly. Larry. Yeah. I think it's important that we have a kind of joined up approach in relation to uh, CFE and the Woods Commission. In fact, we spent a lot of our time when we met with Sunine Wood 
uh, urging them not to reinvent the wheel because the senior phase was already on the stocks, you know, and it was how you complemented that. Um, and uh, I, I think it is uh, an exciting agenda going forward. But here's the thing. School college liaison budgets have been slashed over the last three years. So the capacity of schools to work with colleges in relation to delivery of skills-based courses uh, in schools has been undermined because of austerity measures across the country. So, you know, there's a big agenda here about getting business involved and getting a resource through that. But, we, you know, we need to have an alignment between the policy ambition and the practice of uh, resourcing. Um, otherwise, we end up with unfulfilled uh, potential. Okay, thank you. Um, Tavish. Yeah, the same theme, Kavina. I mean, I still think the, the focus is academic and, and not vocational. We were talking in a parliamentary committee 14 years ago about parity of esteem, and here we are today, and I think you've all said very good things, but we're a long way away from getting this right. So is it the case that by August next year, when my, for example, S3 pupil is an S4 pupil, in that particular secondary school in Scotland, uh, they will have clear routes into vocational college and other options if they want it at the start of S4 in every school across Scotland next by next uh, August? Graham? Yeah, I think you know, the detailed um, implementation plan isn't yet finalised, um, so I wouldn't be able to answer that at this point. We certainly um, are developing a, a five-year plan. All, all the partners are to take this forward with a clear set of milestones and actions for, for each year. And I think, as I say, over the course of the, the next couple of weeks, we'll, we'll hear that response. But there, there's an absolute consensus around this agenda, and there's a real determination to tackle that both the equity issue and the, the different pathways. And with, within Curriculum for Excellence, there is the room for those pathways to be tailored to young people's needs as much as possible. Interesting, at the moment, secondary school would say they have links with employers, but what we want to see is actual co-design and to see employers as consumers of education, so much greater engagement. But we're working hard with everybody to develop that implementation plan, which will give um, dates around the kinds of things that you're looking for. Um, the answer to the specific question about the S3, S4 pupil um, is it depends what school that pupil is attending. One of the features of that, I thought the striking features of the final report from the Wood Commission was that there are probably very few of the 39 recommendations where you couldn't go to somewhere in Scotland and find it being implemented just now. Um, the challenge for Scottish education and Scottish society is to spread out the best uh, practice across uh, across all schools, all colleges and all employers. Um, it's not going to happen overnight when you see the figure that, that, that only a very small minority of employers recruit directly from education, a very small minority of employers currently have links to education. All of that is in the final report. It's not going to happen overnight. And the timescales that the, the final report sets some of them call for immediate action. Some of them look at, for instance, the, the, the partnership agreement between secondary schools has got a three-year timescale. But the main uh, timescales in the final report are 2020. Um, and that's an indication that there's a lot of work to be done, but also there's a lot of good practice out there in which to base that work. Larry. Yeah, I mean, the option you outline, uh, in theory, should have been there last year for the senior phase. It should have been there this year, so, uh, you know, at the risk of uh, agreeing too often, uh, I, would agree, I would agree with Terry that um, it will be dependent upon what senior phase models schools have, um, what local resource they've got in terms of existing uh, college links or existing business links. Uh, so I think it is, you know, the answer would be it's unlikely to be a universal uh, provision across the, the board uh, next year. But hopefully we'll be moving towards a critical mass in terms of that being seen as the, the, the type of pathway that schools should be looking at. Thank you. We've gone through a lot this morning, and, but one of the things that hasn't been, strangely, one of the things that hasn't been discussed are, are the pupils themselves um, to any great extent this morning. I just wondered if you could tell the committee what actions you've taken to seek uh, the opinion or feedback from the pupils who have just gone through the latest part of the uh, curriculum for excellent development. Terry. Again, uh, 
although I'm speaking today for ADES, I can only give an example from my own local authority. So what we are doing at the moment in Western Martinshire is two uh, things. We've issued uh, questionnaires to the current S5 to uh, pupils and parents, um, asking them about their perception of the S4 experience and the first round of national qualifications. Um, we are also convening uh, focus groups of staff, pupils and parents uh, to tease out some of the, the broad questions within the, 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 the questionnaire to try to get a bit more depth to that. Um, we want to learn from the first, the first year's experience uh, and to improve the experience for young people uh, going forward. I do think that there is evidence that it's not just teachers who have suffered from uh, assessment overload in the last year. I think some young people have also felt that and we have a duty to try to make sure that that is reduced going forward. Yeah, just to say that in our inspection programme, there's a pre-inspection uh, pre questionnaire for young people, and we're in the process of analysing the data for last year, um, which will be available shortly. But certainly, um, you know, we ask about our young people enjoying learning at school. In the previous year, near 90% agreed or strongly agreed. 92% um, agreed that we're getting on well with their schoolwork. So we monitor um, young people's views on education very carefully through those questionnaires, which represent you know, a, a sample of schools in different um, areas and uh, sizes and so on. So we monitor that very closely and we'll continue to do so. Thank you. Larry? Yeah. We've uh, two areas in terms of uh, feedback. One is, in the course of last year, we had quite significant feedback from pastoral care staff. Uh, acknowledging or uh, recording uh, increased levels of stress amongst young people who are going through S4. So, you know, there are always some young people who are stressed out by assessment processes, but um, the, uh, there was a significant uh, workload burden uh, and related stress, uh, and especially in schools where they were trying to do uh, seven or eight subjects across a, a one-year course. Um, and the other is just the feedback from our, our subject uh, teachers that um, post-Christmas, uh, some young people were looking at assessments uh, almost on a daily basis in terms of doing seven or eight subjects um, and a number of subjects can't do the unit assessments uh, end on. They have to do them holistically uh, after they've, you've covered a sufficient part of the course. Um, and one of the phrases that was used that we used to be concerned about a two-term dash to hire, we've now got a two-term dash to national five so you know there was you know again agreeing with terry there was a, i think a significant issue for young people in terms of the assessment regime that, that was uh, there last year and some of that might be addressed through the use of more holistic assessment but i think there there were certainly pressures on young people last year okay, thank you ken I mean, I think I would like the committee to know that uh, we actually canvassed the views of uh, pupils as part of the reflections report. A number of the folk that were on the working group spoke specifically, as did I, to, to groups of youngsters. And I think there were two main messages came out. One was, as Larry suggested, the period from January until Easter holidays was a period of uh, in some cases continual assessment and reassessment very often for the very best of reasons that teachers are wanting to give the youngsters the best opportunity to actually pass the unit assessments and therefore pass the examination I think the other thing that came through was that they themselves like many teachers were still getting used to the wider range of assessment approaches whether that be portfolios or projects or whatever uh, and again it's been a, le a learning experience for, th for them I have to say I did come across some youngsters myself who actually quite enjoyed the unit assessments and the regularity of the unit assessments and the regularity of feedback that they got from that ongoing assessment. So whilst it was very much the case that most felt a burden of assessment and reassessment, there were a few who actually quite enjoyed it perversely. Yeah, Jane. Well, at, at the time that the reflections group was uh, beginning, we did raise the point of maybe having focus groups Again, it was widened out through uh, various organisations um, and that's as much as we've done in actual fact, except from hearing the messages back from members about their own particular year groups. But in terms of assessing pupils' opinion, we haven't taken that forward. Uh, Janet? Uh, in terms of S SQA, we have something called My SQA, which is a, um, a web-based uh, engagement with, with SQA, which actually... Um, they, 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 
learners tend to like to engage with. Um, we, we, uh, um, that actually facilitates us on, a, on an ongoing basis to get fairly open feedback from learners on, on what they're feeling about the courses. Definitely around exam time, we get a significant number of um, uh, pieces of feedback. We also monitor student room and, and, and other activities, particularly around the, the, the qualifications period and results time. Um, but I think another another area that we do get feedback is is from the liaison team itself as they go into schools and as they get feedback from from pupils and on on what they're finding. But one of the things we need to do, and we are, we are going to be doing between now and uh, and 2017, is actually looking at monitoring and evaluating how the new courses have gone. And one component of that will be talking to uh, pupils who have undertaken the courses because it, it, th this is something that we need to take the time to really understand the detailed implications of so th that is a piece of work that we're initiating um, pretty soon to be able to not only understand this year but understand what's happening last year understand what's happening this year and understand what's happening next year so we get a full understanding uh, from different groups including students as to how they felt about okay. qualifications thank you and finally Richard uh, similarly to, to Larry, our experience comes through people support and guidance teachers rather than from pupils themselves. But I, I say the two areas that we are aware of are that spring period when there has been, certainly last year, there seemed to be an, an overload of assessment for pupils and associated stress and so on. Also, the perception among certainly some guidance staff that the leap in some subjects between National 5 and higher could be really quite a difficult leap. Um, and uh, concerns that some pupils might not be able to make that step. Can I thank all of you very much for your attendance today? Um, obviously, a number of these points we will raise with the Cabinet Secretary next week. But as I said earlier, if there are any particular points we didn't get through, the long session, but obviously we can't cover everything, just send us an email and we'll uh, hopefully try to uh, include those in our discussions with the Cabinet Secretary next Tuesday. Uh, that concludes the public part of our meeting and we're now moving into private session.